showed the whole thing. So, as we're walking around, I'll just pass along in this film. That's a company called Armor One, and that actually laminates to existing pieces of glass to help uh, prevent with people trying to get in, either using a bat or an axe or a gun. So you can add it to your existing glass. And it helps. So does that replace the kind of old wire thing that used to be in the glass? Is the, that the concept? It, it does. The old wire glass was there for a different reason, um, and now that's turned into ceramic glass. I the wire glass was there for yes. See, it's like wearing a football helmet. So you can see through. Actually, it does. It, it, it does sound like So you can either buy glass that's made with that in the middle of it already, or you can add it to existing pieces of glass. And we're gonna. Um, yeah, no, no, really. Yeah. So, buying all new windows is cheaper. I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Okay. Buying a big I sheet of glass is I assume adding that to the windows is cheaper. Correct, I misheard you. That's correct. Is that included in your calculations for this? Yep, and which windows would you be doing with this? So, what we'll do is um, any window that faces into the secure vestibules that we're talking about, and all the glazing in the doors that enter into the building. And we're actually talking about extending it around the corners onto the outside of the um, building as well to help protect the main office areas. But we want to look at the budget and make sure that we're appropriate. So I know I've got the vestibule covered. I think I've got enough to cover the outside. <coughs> I just want to make sure as we go through. Okay. So where are we in terms of schedule? I don't know if everybody knows, but the track project's already been submitted to SED. We had some success there. They said we're logged in, which is a good thing. Sometimes uh, recently they've uh, increased their bureaucratic powers and they hold things for a long time, waiting for a little tiny piece of paper. But we managed to go through. And in addition to that, we asked for a third party review to help expedite the review process. And we're in the queue to see that happen. The reason that we're asking for third party review we talked about last time is to um, shorten the 40 week review period down to less than 10 weeks. So we think that that's going to really help us out and uh, allow us to see construction of the track and a couple sets of doors in this building during the summer of 2018 as opposed to having to wait until the summer of 2018. As far as phase 1B goes, and we're calling them 1A and 1B because this is phase 1, we talked about splitting the project into an initial sort of capital project and then doing something again in the future. But because we're trying to expedite the track and field, that became 1A. 1B is everything else that's left in the project. I'm sorry, um, can I just, sure. um, you said that we can also do some door work in high school? Mm -hmm. uh, we're putting in some cross corridor doors. Um, and it's gonna be to, um, in the future, split up two history classrooms with a folding partition. And the reason that we had to put the cross corridor doors in where that folding partition is going in between the two classrooms is when that door, that folding partition is open in the classrooms, that room becomes big enough to require two exits out into two different smoke zones. So the cross corridor doors in the hallway uh, split up the smoke to two different So you won't be doing the room divide thing, just the, the doors are the Correct, yeah, we're doing the doors in this part and then we'll do the folding partition a little bit later. Sure. So secure vestibules, um, we're working on that right now. We're going through our design development phase, which means we're working with principals and administration to develop the solutions. And you'll see a little bit about that as we go through. You can see some of the details. And then once we get through the basic design questions, we'll go off and work hard to make sure that the construction documents are created, which are a set of instruments that we give to the contractors to ask for them to give us a price on the project. We want to make sure that they're very precise and exact so that somebody doesn't have a question and gives us good prices. Ultimately, at bid time, when the prices come in all around each other, we know that we've done a good job. Okay? So, SED submission for phase 1B is expected mid May, June. Thanks. It's very okay. <laughs> Are you ready? I am. I am. Um, so, what we're looking at right now is an overview plan of phase 1A or the track project. And I just highlighted a couple of the pieces of what you're gonna see at the new track. The existing pavement stays in place generally everywhere that there's a track today. But we're also going to add to the track 
in what are called new D zones. So they get infilled with pavement, and then once that infill, pavement infill happens, um, the whole track and the new areas get resurfaced with a new rubber coating. So um, because you have to dig up around the perimeter of the track to prep for the new track surface, and you have to dig up around the D zones, we're going to end up sodding the perimeter of the field so that you can play on that as soon as possible. And then we will also create some features um, to help with the track and field events. There'll be a new steeplechase, which is a pit. I don't know if anybody's ever seen a race where you actually run and then you hurdle over into a, a little pit of water. That's going to be there. You have an existing discus pad now, but we're going to put some gravel down in the shot put area so that when you put your shot, it doesn't sink and you lose your shot put, which I guess actually happens now. It's kind of crazy. Yeah, it's so we'll create a new triple jump and long jump area outside of the track. And then the pole vault pits will be on either end of the D zone, depending on which way the wind is blowing. The track coach can pick which way to set up the um, pole vault. So those will be in the D zone areas. Where's the water source for the CPJ? Um, that's going to get provided off the concession building, if I remember right. But I can double check. I don't know exactly. So. It actually comes off where our utility shed is. So our water this one? Is now, yes. Yeah, sorry. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks. One of the things I'd just like to add is that the track coaches are very excited about this. It's, aside from that, they would be all fixed. I mean, but uh, we have a host invitation on WAC meets right now that um, they cannot now fix a lot of the facilities. So I'm very, very excited. I, I would, I've watched other schools fill those pits. Mm -hmm. They need an awful lot of water very quickly. So I would just make sure that somebody's looked into that aspect of the water supply too. Okay. To be able to do that. And most of the schools I've seen it done at, they're running like a fire hose. It, okay. All right, I'll check and see what we've got. Okay. So now we're looking at a small area of East Hill Elementary School, and it's our proposed new entry lobby. It's going to be a secured lobby. We'll replace the doors at the inside and the outside. In general, during class times, the doors on the outside of the building will be open so that a visitor that comes to um, either drop something off to the school or visit somebody in the school will be allowed into the vestibule, but these doors will be locked. There will be a transaction tray like you see at a bank so that somebody can pass something through. Um, I've got to drop off lunch for my son or daughter or a pair of sneakers or something like that. You can do that through the transaction tray. And it will also allow somebody to put their um, license through that transaction window so the license can get scanned and somebody can see whether or not that's a person that you really want in your school before you actually buzz them in through this door. So you're into a locked-in area. This will be locked. These will be locked. If your license is okay, you, you can get uh, buzzed in, and then you can either wait for, maybe you've got a meeting in the main office, or you can go out into the hall. So you'll be buzzed into the office? You'll be buzzed into the office, school. correct. So it'll be a lot like what happens in the high school. Okay, and then we've worked out a, a furniture plan that we think is gonna work pretty well for uh, the amount of furniture that we have in that space. We've increased some file space and some flat area. And, uh, We'll work with Stacy to come up with something as far as the right layout for that space. Stacy, are you comfortable with the way this is shaping? Because I know that there's been a lot of work with members of your staff on what the long term might look like if we could do it. Okay, so this is the newest iteration I've seen with a couple of adjustments from the last one we looked at last year. Okay, thanks. So now we're still at East Hill, but we're moving over to the middle school area. And if you remember right, we're moving some classrooms from this corner of the building. This is the red entry off of the middle school parking lot. Um, we're moving the two classrooms that are in this corner back up towards the, um, rotunda, I call it the rotunda area where the LGI is, speaking of the middle school. Um, and then we're going to <laughs> retrofit the existing space or reconfigure the existing space to accommodate a secure vestibule and a new uh, main office layout. So the principle is the same, not the principle of the building, 
principal concept is the same, where you can walk in through a set of unlocked doors during class time. These doors will be locked and this door will be locked. Another transaction window, so somebody can scan your license, and then once your license is you're cleared for takeoff, you can either come in, well, you will come into the main office and then back out into the school or come in and wait for your and the same kind of transaction window that'll allow you to drop something off for your kids and just take that off. Sure. Why are we not looking at using the entrance words? It is the entrance words. No, I mean the, the uh, why are we not looking at leaving the office complex the way it is and using the entrance off the line? For two reasons. Um, there's no driveway up there and it doesn't provide clear line of sight access out into the parking lot. So this is actually um, provides better control of the site because we're adding some windows into the outside to allow Chris to see um, out into the parking lot. And uh, on the back side there, there's access to a playground and that's really all there is. It's sort of, it's not really an entry at all. This is the entry into the building, so you need control of where people are going to come up. If we asked people to come around the back, we'd have to develop some parking back there in a driveway. I'm not sure I agree with you parking there. Okay. You definitely need a walkway. Right. But rearranging the whole building seems like an awful expensive thing when we already have a double door entrance over at the office. I hear you. One of the considerations, because we had talked about this, this has been chatted about a few times prior to the capital project, is to put a walkway, one of the uh, concerns is you put a walkway, you're going past a whole bank of classrooms. So people would come and have to walk the whole way around to the door at the end for the entry. So that was a consideration to the exposure of classrooms. The other, the other issue is unless you cover it, they're walking the whole length of the building outside of the weather before you can enter the building. Um, you got to walk a long way to come into this building. And it's not covered. I, it's a lot of money to rearrange the whole building. I just question whether that's wise use of funds. And I, I really. I think ultimately I'm looking for a good explanation on why we can spend that much money just to do a the entire thing. It's too Maybe I'm the only person, but it's I two classrooms. It, our conversations in the past around this, and this was the concept designed from the very beginning. I know, and so, I challenged it from the very beginning. Yeah, that's okay. But it because of the entrance into the school is at that building, you have your office folks right there so that you can manage people coming into the building right there from the entrance that everybody comes in. From our estimation, that was the safest way to secure an entrance into the building. I wouldn't spend my money that way. Okay. And as a board member, I think I'm asked to think that way. Mm -hmm. Sure. We have had positive responses from the work that we've done out talking to people when we were doing our sitting downs, if you will, um, and showing people the plans that were on the, the pull-up part, or those pull-up banners, that there, was, there were positive responses that we received from folks, particularly parents of middle schoolers. So what else is done? I, I mean, just my, my own feeling is I think conceptually it makes the most sense to have the door that's the entrance to be the one that you first come to and when you get to the building. Um, and as well when people are leaving, you know, it just um, seems to make sense to me. And um, I, I understand your concern about the expense, but it seems to be the most sensible solution from you know, we've um, talked about doing that side a number of times, and there seems to be you know, a number of concerns about it. And, um, I think we, you know, while um, I, I guess.
just that, that could be made to work. I think that that would not be the best solution. I mean, it's no different than this door. It's the shortest one in the parking lot, but it's not the shortest to build. But it can be used as an exit. So I understand that I'm, I'm hearing you. From, there actually is a security reason to stick with this entrance. And that is part of what Debbie talked about. You're bringing people further into the site and past classroom windows. And having the command of the parking lot allows you to be hopefully vigilant about what's happening in the parking lot. If you see a car that you know is, belongs to somebody that you don't want on campus, you can take some preventative steps. Or if you see somebody sketchy coming into the building, you can take the steps a little bit quicker than you can if they were coming up. Yeah. So that's that's the basic design. But yeah, you're right. It's a more expensive solution than adding a sidewalk along. So what else is happening in East Hill? This is a floor plan of the Nellis Gym, some existing equipment and some proposed. And what we're planning on doing is actually cutting holes into the gym high up in the wall um, in the gym so that we can access the mechanical spaces that have the air handling units in there now. We'll replace the air handling units with new to provide the proper amount of ventilation and to um, help with the situation where you're getting some backdrafting of existing boiler fumes into the air handling units um, and uh, improve the longevity of those units. What we'll leave in place after we cut the holes in the wall are a couple doors so that uh, 30 years later when you have to do replacement job again, you'll have easier access into that space and you won't have to, basically the reason that we're considering that is these units were built into the space when the building was constructed and it's impossible to fit the size units through the doors that we have to get uh, through that path interior to the building. Not related to this, but Nellis made me think of when the pool was done, were the air handling units up there? Upgraded as well. They did. They, they, I, they, I they did the whole ventilation system. system. I don't know exactly what they did, but they definitely changed the ventilation. Okay. Yeah. The pool ventilation you're talking about? Yes. Yeah, yeah, that was done. Back in 2008. Yeah. Well, then it's. I, I've had kids on the swim team since then, so that that room still gets awfully hot. Not nearly as bad as it used to. Be. So I just questioned you talking about air handling units and Nellis made me think is, is there proper airflow there um, because if you get overheated if you go and sit for a swim. Yeah. yeah. Just getting air handling units and Nellis. You don't sweat anymore? Thanks. I used to. I used to sit there better, and Nellis. Better man than me. <laughs> So what else happens on East Hill? Um, there's a couple areas of roofing that need to be removed and replaced, particularly um, the connector corridor, so that the roof will be stripped off. And there's a ballasted roof on top of the six straight wing that we'll remove and replace as well. Thanks. I was surprised, because I thought we had some roof problems in other places in this school. So I was surprised that the roof repairs were to those, those are roof replacements. There is, there is some work that can be done here, but only repairs, not replacements. Okay, so the, some of these areas that we were having issues. So those are all in the scope of this. That's really what I. Was yeah, thinking. I just don't have a drawing for. Okay. Yep. Right. And this is a really crude drawing, but um, as part of the project, we'll be replacing interior door hardware on classrooms and that will be with a mind towards security as well. That's going to happen in East Hill and up here at the high school as well. Can you explain how it's going to include the security of the classroom? Sure. So there's a couple different uh, approaches. This isn't a very good example. This is a better example. Classroom lock sets um, have to lock, have to be able to be open from the inside no matter what. But in a conventional school where lock, lock sets have not been changed, you typically have to go out into the classroom with a key to lock the door from the corridor side. And when there's a crazy event going on, you don't want to have somebody out in the corridor. So um, new intruder classroom lock sets typically have a key lock 
on the inside. So that would be one approach. That's a mechanical approach. Another approach would be to control the classroom doors electronically, and that's what we're exploring right now. So that means put um, card readers like you have on the outside doors on every classroom. And then you'll have uh, typically have a bathroom pass kind of card. And in the event of a lockdown, 99% of the cards are ineffective. So that if somebody's walking around, they can't, can't yeah, yeah, and they can't make somebody else. Open. So the price that you scoped is which one of those options? The electronic version. Okay. Yep. I have another question on that. Um, are <coughs> the class doors going to have this material added to them? No, we, we do not have that in the scope right now. Yep. So I think over time there's discussion about how else do you harden the building, how much of the doors do you put and Armor One is the name of the product. On classroom door glass, do you put it on the first floor, exterior windows? So, yeah. But incrementally, take your bites and do what you can. So, what is it called again? Armor One. Armor. Yep. Just how expensive is that stuff per square foot? <sighs> Roughly. <coughs> Roughly 10 to $15 a square foot, depending on how much you're getting. Okay. Uninstalled. So yeah. installed, it's double that. Is it hard to install? Um, it needs somebody that's certified with it, yes. Yep. Is it a ruling process? Yeah, it's just like doing an almost like a vinyl sign kind oh. of thing. Yeah. But you get the pros no, do it I without bubbles. You need yeah. Yeah. Knows yeah. What to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, thanks. And so how are we addressing security at the high school? This is a big plan of the high school, and everybody knows that this is the atrium, and this is where you enter now. So we're improving a little bit on the uh, situation where right now you can walk in to the secure vestibule and you buzz in, but when, once you're buzzed in, you're allowed into the school. So we're extending the vestibule out to the main office door to have the same approach as we have at the elementary school and at the middle school. You walk into the vestibule, there'll be a transaction window into the front desk so you can do your drop off of your sneakers or lunch, uh, scan your license, and if you're okay to come in, then this door will get buzzed and you can make your way into the school. Thank you. I, I couldn't make it out. Yeah, it's small, I apologize. So, question, is the space for the added vestibule coming from the office or coming from the foyer? It'll come from the foyer. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right, there's a bunch of other stuff that we don't have drawings of, so I just made a quick list for everybody to uh, Remember what we've talked about in the past. One of the items that we've hit on, steam to hot water boiler conversion at East Hill Elementary might become part of an EPC project. If, yep, so just so everybody knows that that's up for negotiation. And if it does go to the EPC, that frees up money for us to do more work at the other buildings or, you know, as part of this project. So that might mean that we can add Armor One to the doors or do something else. So that's what we're looking at. Um, there's several ventilation or several rooms where we're adding ventilation on top of the Nellis Gym. That's the nurse's office and the faculty room at East Hill. So that's going to happen. Um, video camera replacement is going to happen typically wherever we have analog cameras. So we go to internet protocol cameras and we'll add to the existing camera system as well so that more of the campus is covered and recorded over time, 30 days of storage. and. Um, the camera system that we actually talked about today has some analytics built into it. So you can catch people's uh, license plates because of the, pic the pixelation, pixel is that the right word? Yeah, pixel resolution of the cameras. Or you can, um, some of the analytics are something like, hey, look for the guy with the tan jacket and the gray glasses that's walking around. And every camera that picks the guy with the gray glasses and the tan jacket on will come up on somebody's computer so you can follow them through the school in an event. Um, if you remember right, we talked about doing the great room floor tiles. We've come up with a solution for that. We're going to do a rubber floor in there, which I think is going to be comfortable and nice looking, and it's easy to maintain. Um, we are approaching What's the longevity of that? fifty plus years. So it's the same from your perspective. Um, it's actually time. better than today's vinyl tiles. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And the nice thing is, it's a, a lower life cycle cost, a little bit more expensive than vinyl tile today but you don't have to wax it, so it's cheaper in the long run. 
solar water heating for the pool. Mike Eckhart and McFarland Johnson are helping us put that together. There's a couple of details that we got to figure out with that still. And um, the pump on the pool today works way over time, so we're coming up with a bigger pump to help cool that down before it fails. Before you leave these two? Sure. You don't have any door hardware on that list. Is there nothing that we need to do to harden that building? No, we've got it included. I just had it shown on the pictures because I had that door schedule shown okay. and then I so had the secure was that vestibule. All buildings then? Because I noticed you had a line. I, I don't have a specific drawing for the high school, so that's okay. why I had a list. So that list. drawing was East Hill? It was. Okay, okay. thank you. Yep. Yep. Um, and same thing here video cameras will augment the existing system and replace any analog cameras. Plus, we'll uh, replace the clock system. It's tough to adjust. When will it be synchronized then? Just like swimmers, absolutely. Okay, and if everybody remembers, there's no card readers at the bus garage right now, so we'll add access control to the bus garage and we'll add cameras in there as well. Thanks. So, just a quick update on uh, budget. There's a total project cost of about $5 million, $4,986,750. Phase 1A is submitted. That Total project cost is $820,000. That's the part that's up at SED right now for the track and the doors. The remainder of phase 1B is about $4 million, two, roughly. And uh, we'll hold aside the budget for 1A and uh, keep track of that when it comes time to bid that, hopefully in early June. And? Are we doing anything with the field surface? The football field or no? Other than adding the solder on the perimeter, no. No, the no field drainage is, work or anything? There will be drainage around the interior of the track, but we're not going out into the field with drainage. Yep. So by adding it around the perimeter, it should help. It should help. Okay. Yep. Yep. But yeah, we just didn't have that in the scope. So. so what do we do next? purpose of showing you these pictures is so that we can get any public comment so filter things through your principal or through Debbie or Gary so they can get back to me and I can make any adjustments that we need to anybody um, we're going to continue to work with district staff and administration so that we can develop the designs for phase 1b and we can still make adjustments on phase 1a if anybody has any comments but I wanted to get that drafted and input uh, into SED as a final submission so we could get that thing moving for June um, and then sometime mid-April, uh, we will estimate phase 1B, where we are with our drawings, combine that with our phase 1A estimate, and report back out to you as to where we think we stand. And uh, once 1A is bid, we'll know where we stand partially. And once 1B is bid, we'll know exactly where we stand. So that's a good thing. So that's it for next steps and where we are right now. Does anybody have any questions? That concludes from the audience. The, uh, the um, drawings are all up on the CAT project page of the website, so you can take a look at them there. The public presentation is also on board docs as well, so and it'll go up after tonight on the CAT project page of the website. So that information has been up there all week. So if the pictures look too small, there's another opportunity to look at them and load them up on your computer. Do we have benches on the other side of the field. Yes. Is that going to get impacted by what we're doing with the long triple jump? It will be, yes. Yeah, but those are portables, right? They're right. on the yeah, other side? Yeah. Yeah. You just move them a lot closer to yep. the track. Yep. Yep. So they'll fit. I don't know the scale here. We, we can actually move them out for track season, move them in for football. Okay. They're easy enough to do that. Yeah, they're not that far.
session to consider uh, personnel matters and so forth. Oh, I have to call the meeting to order. <laughs> okay, call the meeting to order. I'm not going to repeat everything that I just said. <laughs> um, uh, anyhow, and then you're welcome, obviously, to come back after exec session if you want to hear us approve or reveal whatever it is that we spoke about in executive session. Just one other thing I wanted to mention. As you probably have noticed in the last few meetings, when we've been discussing different issues um, and people have information to add to those issues, um, you know, we've been happy to get that information. One thing I would just ask is that you please raise your hand and be recognized before speaking so we don't get you know, too out of control. But other than that, we appreciate that and I think it helps us to more efficiently resolve issues and thank you for your input. Okay, so um, we'll start with the public session, and anybody have something else? There's no, no, nobody indicated that they had any comments. You know, the first point on the agenda is capital project update, but since we just went through that, I think if the board would agree, we could um, pass through that. Mm -hmm. Is that agreement? Okay. Um, next thing is the smart school investment plan. So um, the District Technology Committee has met, I believe, four times now over the last couple months. And really, the, the, I think the, the main part of our meeting for the last three meetings really has been um, developing the SSIP. So essentially, what's outlined in our SSIP are the devices that we're looking to purchase um, as part of the SSIP. We're outlining right now 885 uh, Dell 11-inch Chromebooks. We currently have roughly 90, nope, 120 of those units in use in Canajahari right now. There are three mobile labs in each, or one mobile lab of 30 in each library, and there are also currently um, 10 units being deployed to each library um, for teacher sign up. Um, those will be able to be signed up by teachers um, and eventually students so they can become more familiar with the technology as we, over the next six months to a year transition to the one-to-one -one environment. Um, another part of the purchase um, is going to be 115 Apple iPads. Um, we are actually going to deploy the iPads at the kindergarten level and also the first grade level. In kindergarten, they will not have the Dell Chromebooks. They will have um, strictly iPads. And in first grade, we'll actually start transitioning them from iPads to Chromebooks. So they'll be able to bridge between both of them in first grade. And that was, Ms. Ward, if I'm correct, at the desire of the first grade teachers. So they voiced the desire to maybe expose the students to both, and they'll transition in second grade to fully um, Chromebooks. 
but that will give us, the 115 units will give us the full kindergarten, half of the first grade, and then also um, our overage. Um, also in this is um, 20 smart units, the 62, 65. Uh, smart starting to change their, um, I guess, product model. Um, most of us identify smart with as an overhead projector that casts down onto a touch board. Essentially, smart's chart starting to change. They're now changing their product line to interactive flat panels. So essentially, a large LED television that is touch point sensitive as well as writing sensitive. Um, the really cool thing about the new line of smart, if anyone's used a smart board, essentially you've been stuck to one person working on it at a time. Um, even as you're writing, I've, as a teacher, have hit my elbow on it and started writing somewhere else. One of the cool things about the new series of smart boards is they actually recognize between 20 and 80, depending on the model, touch points at one time. So now you truly can have a group of students at the smart board working together on math problems, on editing an essay, on whatever the case may be. So that is really the direction smart's heading. They're phasing out the projectors, the bulbs, things like that. Um, in my research on smart, or in our research on smart, uh, the new smart boards actually have 50,000 hour um, lifespans, which if you leave them on and use them 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, they would re last roughly five and a half years. So they have a, a pretty exceptional lifespan, which currently now I think the oldest smarts that we have in, in terms of the touch boards, are about 12 or 13 years old, which I think these should surpass that. Um, and they do have a, a typical five-year service warranty. And then the cost allotment um, that's in there, uh, there's a 5% increase just for the normal fluctuation in the price of uh, technology between now and when we purchase them. Um, if we could scroll down a little bit, um, really the one thing I, I want to, right there is perfect. Um, one of the things I think we're the most proud of is we had to come up with a technology vision statement. And our, our two uh, student members on the technology committee, uh, as well as the teachers and the administrators on it, are very proud of the vision statement that we came up with. Empowering students to create limitless opportunities using technology. Um, and working with, in working with Ms. Jones, she's, she's been quite adamant about you know, the workplace and the digital workplace and how you know, what we're teaching in school needs to translate to whether it's higher education, vocational school, career readiness, or the new you know, digital driven economy is, I think you put it. Innovation. Innovation economy, excuse me. Um, so we are very proud of that. If you uh, scroll down through the documents, <laughs> uh, essentially the main parts of the SSIP are um, benchmarks of you know, how will this benefit the district. So just general student learning through the purchase, whether it's digital interaction and engaging students, students having the opportunity to le learn new skills, coding, gamification, um, working on different platforms, things like that. Um, differentiated instruction, expanded learning inside and outside of the building. Um, one of the real cool things about Chromebooks is they are cloud-based technology. You do not have to purchase anything for them. Um, if you've ever gone home and tried to work on Microsoft and you don't have Microsoft Office, there's a cost to that. Even purchasing it through a school district as a school subscription, there's still a cost to that. Cloud-based Google accounts are free. Now, the limit to it is internet connection. Um, you know, there's areas of our community that have, don't have access to high-speed internet. They only have um, satellite-driven inter internet. And in some cases, there's still parts that have dial-up internet or strictly rely on um, their cell phone. Uh, one of the things that we've out that's outlined in here is we would have to explore maybe creating community hotspots where even if students couldn't get them from their house, if they live in a rural community or rural area of our community, could we somehow deliver internet to them um, in a centralized location? Um, something I've touched upon uh, in the, as part of the technology committee, Little Falls, as part of their one-to-one, -one, actually contracted through Verizon, and they were able to provide students with Chromebooks that were mobile hotspots. Um, I think they deployed about 30 to the families in the district that either lived outside of the internet connection or that financially needed that assistance because they didn't have access to high-speed internet. So there are options that are out there that could absolutely um, be plausible for what we're delivering in terms of the one-to-one. -one. Um, you know, 
one of the big things, uh, we spent a lot of time when we met uh, this most recently on Tuesday um, about this idea of the learning gap. Um, you know, we're hoping that this one-to-one -one really, you know, levels the playing field, so to speak. You know, we're giving access to technology um, to students who maybe, A, have not traditionally been able to afford it at home, but also, B, technology that has the ability to, you know, bring text-to-speak function. Um, you know, some of the annotation ability and some of the downloadable apps, some of the freeware, whether it's, you know, simply being able to highlight something, that it extracts that out of the reading, so now we don't have to read back through, and it's, it's, it's taking those main ideas and setting them aside for a reader. Um, there, there really are some fantastic programs, that are, excuse me, not programs, apps out there. Um, many of them are free, some of them are downloadable to individual users, and then some of them can be delivered to a whole platform for actually a very reasonable cost. Um, um, enhanced parent stakeholder communications. As students become, you know, more, I guess, digitized with the platform, um, we're hoping that it will also facilitate parent communication um, back to the school. Students will be bringing these devices home, um, especially in the middle and uh, high school, and hopefully as the parents see the students use that, that increases the parent involvement. It also increases the, that parent um, contact back to us um, at the district level. And it also facilitates um, off-site uh, collaboration with students. One of the real marvelous things about the Google platform is it, it really is conducive to peer-to-peer -to -peer collaboration in terms of group, group projects. Um, for example, in our, in our team meetings as we meet as an administrative team, all six of us can be on the document at once making edits in different places and then you know, in, a, in a quick click you can go back and trace who edited what and who added what and who subtracted what. And if you're not happy with something you guys did, you can, in a click of a button, backtrack to the previous version. So these are the types of things we'll actually be, you know, these are the tools we'll be giving to students so they now they can start, you know, not only collaborating via work, but editing each other's work. And there's accountability there because it actually shows who's done what, which is pretty fantastic. Um, professional development. Um, in the plan, we, we pretty much have, have I, I think, a pretty wide scope of, of different professional <coughs> development opportunities, whether it's, you know, peer-to-peer -peer in the district, people who are already comfortable using technology, helping people who are, who are maybe not. Um, NERIC or HFM BOCES driven professional development through things like model schools. Um, also, some of the vendors that we have, um, such as TEQ, that's T-E-Q, they actually offer online learning suites where you can become Google certified by taking a, a 12 course online um, professional development uh, pathway. All, and they do the same thing for a smart suite and things like that. So there really is a multitude of different professional devel development opportunities that we could really cater to the individual teacher um, as they're taking their journey into entering the, to this one-to-one -one environment as well. And then the very last thing on here is uh, the sustainability plan. We expect that most of these devices, um, if kept in good working order, meaning students you know, do take care of them, they should have a four to five year um, use, uh, lifespan. Um, we're hoping that some of them could go past that if taken care of, but naturally there's going to be repairs, there are going to be um, breakages, whether accidental or on purpose, and there's the, the natural attrition of some units that will just stop working for whatever reason. Um, the, I don't want to say it's a downfall, the only, um, the only drawback to Chromebooks versus laptops, the cost is amazing. They're, they're in generally half the price. The only drawback is re replacement versus repair. Um, repairs generally become instantly more expensive than replacing it. Um, for example, a, a 200-ish dollar Dell Chromebook to replace the screen would probably cost you close to 250 to $300 by the time you have the screen purchased, the labor charge, and, and, and the things that go along with that. Even sometimes things like key replacement don't become po possible because the cost of replacing the keys and the labor involved sometimes outweigh the actual purchase cost of the book when you factor in state aid and things like that. Um, so we're, we're hoping four to five years. Um, 
the software can be pushed out almost instantaneously. You can cater the applications that you are giving to students. If we have 10 students who, for a class, require a certain application that costs $15, we can download it to those 15 students and the teacher. If we want to deliver an app to the entire um, student body, um, we can do that and we can push that out to all users in the domain. Another part of this, um, I don't believe if we outlined in here, because this is really going to take us to a Google Apps for Education school, um, eventually email will also be transitioned over into Google um, because those things work seamlessly together as opposed to jumping on Outlook and then jumping onto another platform to now use the calendar that you have in Outlook and now on Google. So by transitioning that over, it will create one seamless cloud-based environment. Please, if I missed anything, tech committee people, please jump in. Okay, thank you. Any questions that I might be able to Any answer? Questions, comments? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I didn't see any support cost. What are we estimating the support of us going to roughly a thousand units? How much is that going to cost us? I can answer that. The, the SSIP cannot, the Smart Schools Fund Act does not allow for support costs. So what we have is we have our um, service with NARIC for the, C, the oh shoot, no, CTS. CTS service, thank you, the Cooperative Technology Service. We also have in here, although we can't fund it, and also as part of the budget, a Librarian Tech Integration Specialist position that we are proposing as well to support, to provide the support for the training. So the CTS service will support the hardware, the network, the infrastructure, the um, secondary position, librarian, tech integration specialist would support the professional development. So how much do we anticipate the cost of CTS would go up by adding a thousand units? It, it does, it's a service, so they provide, they provide a service for whatever amount of um, devices that you have or whatever your structure is. So it's the service that you purchase that covers what you have. And they know about this, they they know what we're doing, they're informed. So you think their bill will remain flat? Their bill will go up, we already have that cost. That bill is going up 5%, but it's going up 5% whether we have 20 machines or 2,000 machines. Because it's a service charge. The estimated charge for the library and tech integration specialist with salary and all benefits is about $75,000. And I have that proposal to distribute later. And it's on this really huge sheets too, what we're doing just to add, add on to that, if you don't, if, uh, you don't mind, um, in my former employer that um, was a one-to-one -one environment, something else they did for basic maintenance, just in terms of managing student accounts, you know, cleaning up a machine, transitioning a broken machine to another one, um, certain teachers actually asked for that to be their duty. So instead of having a study hall per se or something like that, they'd actually have tech duty and they would help out with those machines um, once a day or every other day depending on their schedule. And that became just an in-house duty, and we kind of, you know, ma ma maintain those ourselves. There are lots of people who are willing to do that. Um, and we also talked about students as well, so yeah, I don't want to computer science and computer interns. science interns as well for some of the low-level maintenance. Can you remind us how this grant works? And yep. I knew that the support wasn't part of the grant, Correct. but I wanted to know. How it yep, that's okay. We had it covered. It is covered in there. So the way the grant works is it's a reimbursement grant. This document will be posted on the website with a Google form for public comment for 30 days. We bring it back to um, the board at the April meeting for final approval with any comments. Um, and then it goes off to state ed for approval. Once we get the approval, then we'll be able to expend the money and be reimbursed within 90 days. Okay, so it's really no impact to the budget. Correct, there's no impact to the budget. Um, I couldn't remember if there was a percentage. Yeah, no, nope, there's no impact to the budget. The other piece is the total dollar amount is about a million, 1.1, no, somewhere a little over a million dollars. You don't have to, and nor should you, well you could I guess, look at this as a one shot deal and spend all the money right away, so we're looking at phasing it in because there are other uses for the money that we may want to consider in the future, such as security cameras. That might be something we would want to consider as we move along with the capital project 
And then there's some other things like pre-K classroom building. That's part of it. We don't need that. But as we move forward with technology, because you don't know what technology is going to do in the future, you certainly have the opportunity to submit different phases over time. I have one other question. Do, do we have an estimate of how many um, hotspot kind of solutions we would need to come up with based on our school population? Geogra geographically versus economics are, are probably two different solutions. I don't know the answer geographically. I don't know the southern part of our district well enough and the dead spots well enough. Um, I don't. I think those conversations were had before I was here. Okay. And do we have any idea? I, I love the solution that you came up with at the other school from Verizon. Do we have any idea what that costs? Because that would be a budget item. For right. Us. And that is something we are still exploring. So we wanted to get this part done. So we can get it in the queue and get it on the website, and then we'll start working on those other ancillary pieces. Uh, I just want a clarification because I came in late. So we're looking at increasing the NERIC services. No, it's no. maintaining the maintaining. It's CTS services. Okay, yeah. CTS services, and we're looking at you said hiring. Is it one yep. librarian? Library slash tech integration specialist. Okay. There's a proposal this evening. That All right, is. so that's um, that's going to support the, the thousand computers. I think that's enough. Right. Because there already are some people who already are familiar with the platform and who are already using things. So there will be some other ways that we can support person. In my prior district, I had a tech integration specialist for a district of about the same number. Okay. Um, oh. Very busy person, but we also then, one of the values to that is you can start to turn key train so other people who are interested then take the lead and then help their colleagues. So there's a whole way to do peer-to-peer um, -peer support over time that you can build. And Chris, uh, Mr. Pat, in my former district, essentially we had approximately 650 units in use just in one building. It was supported by one teacher a day as a tech duty, the librarian as a I forgot my Chromebook or I have damage, can I have a rental or a, a loaner for the day? Um, essentially, and then a NERIC support person. And that ran just in my building about 650 units. All right. Okay. All right, well, I have, I have a couple of comments and questions. Um, first of all, I would really like to thank the uh, tech committee for the work they've done. It's a very impressive um, thing they put together. Um, and it's very exciting to me to see that we're actually moving into the 21st century as a district. I'm a little bit nervous. And, um, and the reason I'm nervous is because just because we have the technology does not mean that we will utilize it fully and to the best advantage. And so I really, really want to strongly encourage and endorse and support the maximum amount of professional development so that we can maximize the impact that these units can have. Because if they just have them, it doesn't mean anything unless we really integrate them into our educational process. And that requires a significant amount of professional development. Um, and I, I really want to encourage that that part of your proposal be fully and strongly implemented. And, and that's already started. Uh, Ms. Ward coordinated with Model Schools, and I believe on Tuesday, Tuesday, Model Schools is coming to us as a regional site, and we have teachers who are able to sign up for a full day actual advanced Google training for Google Apps, and also kind of a crash course for beginners after school for people who are, hey, what's Google Apps? Um, because there are people who might search the building for the Google Classroom, um, and, and they're not going to find it. Um, but we're, I think the professional development part is, is essential, and it's really catered to what's going to be best for each individual person. Because there are people who are going to take it and run and need very little in terms of implementing that in their classroom. Well, they were forward or back with that stuff. Well, we're, we're hoping forward. And there, there are people who are going to need, you know, really hand-to-hand, -hand, show me how to do it type of professional. Development. I can tell you at the high school level, um, we actually started a couple of years ago with just within the English department and the library. And, of course, um, 
I, I came to them and we were kind of plotting and we've been using Google Classroom and Docs for the last two years already so it's been and it's slowly been spreading out from there You'll, and our librarian over at the elementary school has also been uh, in fact she helped us at our last meeting we always find a new button that we didn't know you could do that when they add things on so a lot of it has already started before we even had the machines so there is a very good start in place but there still are others that do need a little more support and, there, and I also want to thank our, our computer science interns because they've been pretty good too when I when someone comes in and I'm busy I'm like uh, you know Tyler can you go down and help uh, Miss Hammonds with the Google Classroom and they're always willing to do that. So. Um, and the other thing I would like to say, this is my self speaking I haven't really moved on to the board but I think we would knowing the board I think we would all be on the same page with this, which is that this concept of each student having internet access at home mm -hmm. is an essential part of this of this plan. As far as I think I can speak for all of us to say that, and so we would really like to hear, you know, what that would entail and what would be realistic and possible, so that each student that has a Chromebook can use it no matter where they are, um, and uh, you know, no matter where they live, no matter what their economic um, situation is. So yeah, the private just, sector is actually working a lot on that uh, without mm -hmm. any input from us. Yeah. Um, there's a new company now that's trying to have airplanes that are flying overhead to be constantly emitting um, internet access to cover some of those points in the United States where it's almost impossible. So I have a feeling a lot of that problem in the next few years is going to become smaller and smaller as we go along and that's without the school having to spend any money at all because it's becoming profitable to, to provide that in the private sector so I'm kind of excited about just I'm just saying that in implementing this yeah. I think that's it for me at least and I think for the board that would be an essential piece of the plan so please um, but thank you for all your work and now I just gave you some more. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. First. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you talking about the professional development mark, I think a bigger piece in my mind is bringing this together with the curriculum mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that we're making the right changes of how we're delivering the curriculum right. yes. into an online right. mode, which it's not so much using the computer as it is, okay, how do I get access to the right types of materials that I use electronically? Right. And again, our school librarians are already well poised to do a lot of that work and do a lot of that work already. Um, the departments at the secondary level already meet and work on curriculum things, so this would become a part of their work as well. So some structures are already in place that are going to allow this to feed into and be embedded into the work that's going on. I think I'm so excited. I think all the hard work that you guys are doing on the committee, just a couple things. I know um, for kinds of uh, this work is non-negotiables for things of how we implemented it. Are there going to be like non-negotiables where every teacher kind of dabbles in um, Google Classroom? I have to say as a parent, I love it. I can go on my phone at any time, know exactly what my kids' homework is, what their grade is, what they're missing, what their quiz score is. If they were late, tardy, at literally just a push of a button. Sometimes it's almost too much information because I'm like sending them screenshots of, hey, you didn't hand in your homework or you didn't. I love Google Classroom and it was a non-negotiable for my uh, kids' teachers and I loved that part of it. Um, and will we be trained like this summer by a certified Google trainer like if we're willing to go for a week to a training center? Would that, is that something that will be covered this summer to be trained by uh, certified Google trainers. I know in Albany, I, I'm pretty sure like in Gloversville, my husband was able to go for a week down to Albany and you had an X amount of courses. And I think they actually kind of encouraged every single faculty member to do the week-long training, if at all possible. And I, I just think that if they're trained and you have those non-negotiables, it just, I, like I'm excited about this. I'm excited about Tuesday. You know, I just, so the next step that goes along with this is that the district's instructional technology plan has to also be updated. There's a new format for the years 2018 to 2021. So the district tech committee and thinking about how to, to manage all of this, you've got to get in the queue 
and while we're in the queue, then we can, then the tech committee can outline some of those other things, Andrew, that you're talking about. So what is the minimum going to be, expectation going to be, and how do we help everybody be supported in that? So that is going to be, now that, once this piece is done, that, that's the next piece to do. And by the way, the tech plan has to be submitted by October. So the timing of this all seems to be working pretty well. What is our projected timeline to be one? Back last meeting, um, we had put up a timeline that we were looking at late fall. Because you have to allow time for the plan to sit at SED for a while. Um, I'm on the flip side. I'm looking more, what are we doing to educate the students? What is the what are going to be the training for the students? Um, we're, we've also toyed with you know students don't do homework, so why are we now sending them home with technology that they may or may not be able to whatever with? Um, is you know are we now flipping and we're going to do more online homework assessments pieces at night with them? Um, and is there with the numbers that we have, are they going to now have like, okay, mine's broken, now what? Are we rent, are they taking one out? Okay, mine broke again. Like what, what requirements are the students going to have to make sure that nobody themselves or anybody else destroys that piece of technology? Because if we're going one-to-one, -one, I've already had issues with where are we printing? Oh, you shouldn't print if you're going one-to-one. -one. Okay, but, you know, yep. there's a lot of little pieces. Yep. We're, we're focusing on the teacher aspect. I'm not so wor so much worried about the teacher training and the, and the because I've already seen who's using it, at least in the high school, middle school. Um, I'm worried about the student responsibility as replacements and, and destruction of it and whatnot. I would hope they wouldn't, but it's not they're not paying for it. Sometimes that's I'm concerned. So the district tech committee members have already been researching that and um, and have already been posting up documents and things for the tech committee to consider. There will most likely be some policy implications as well. So that again you bring up a great point and folks are already working on it. Like it, it you know is there going to be a if they break it once, okay. Yeah. If they break it twice, is there a payment? That, that's what when we're going to have to figure come out. come in yeah. and say, I can't, I can't afford this. And right, and I do know that that there are places that have already figured it out. Tracy, okay. Tracy, you, Tracy, you put up a lot of stuff about yeah, that. I, yeah, 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 I did. I found some things. Yeah, she found some things that were very useful in terms of helping us frame our conversation and our discussions, which yeah. we will have. We just haven't had yet because we wanted to get this piece done. Yeah, because I mean, my kid, I might be able to afford to replace my right, kids, but somebody else, but somebody can. else can't. But it, it should it be equal. I, I just wanted to, um, with, and actually, Carolyn brought up the children, the kids, the students in there, and they're training in it. And I just want to encourage. I have my integrated office technology class. I invited you guys to go up and, and view my bulletin board up there, the work that the kids did, and I'm just gonna. I, I would like to encourage my principal and my guidance department, encourage them to take my integrated office technology class. It's all on, it's all Google. We're doing slides, sheets, sites, um, docs, uh, drawing, forms, all of it. I would like to encourage, um, I know the kids can't take, you know, they have to pick and choose, but I mean, if there's, if there's a class that maybe is required, for graduation, that might be it. Because um, I actually had a student whose dad is was using it at his work, and he came home and asked his daughter, "Do you know how to do this?" And she's like, "Oh yeah, you just do this." So I just want to throw that out there. Yeah, as as something that and and actually I met with Miss Gleason and Mrs. Lenz about. Um, a senior like a seminar. course, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. A, um, yeah. that is a, a senior seminar that is all about. I mean, we talk. We're, we'll be doing soft skills, but we'll also be talking about. They'll be t doing documents on car insurance and renters insurance mm -hmm. and everything they're going to possibly need to know. 
when they get out there. So I'd like to encourage that discussion with my principal and my guidance department to really push that class. If you could also, Tracy, it'd be a great conversation too with the district tech committee. So maybe our next meeting you could bring like your course outline and all Absolutely. the things that are about there because there's also now a backfill to that too. So it shouldn't be by the time they get to high school. No, how do we take that skill set yeah. and what does that look like at a younger age? So if you would, if you'd be willing to bring that to our next meeting. And I, and my, and I just let me say one. So I have my integrated one and I also have my integrated two. And these guys are going farther then okay so uh, it's it's they're just they're they're great and I, I if you could talk to my students I think you'd be amazed they help the teachers when they're doing stuff so I just and the culture that. that is fabulous okay <laughs> thank you okay so uh, yeah. looking forward to yeah. uh, moving on this a month from now and uh, the next thing on the agenda is course scheduling update to do is provide an update on how course scheduling and the curriculum is moving along this year. We broadened it, just broadened it out for a bigger scope. There's some specific information in here based on some notes that the board had offered before. But we also wanted to just take a minute to look at what each building is doing and how it all ties together. Because some of the work that we're doing is linked together. And so in order to have a whole picture, you have to see how the links work and what's going on. So. Um, we'll start at the high school though because that's really where we're going to start tonight, I guess. We're going to start with the high school, I guess, because we're going to start with the high school and ask Ms. Gleason just to give an update on where things are and what we, where we are in the process um, and what other, I'm just going to stop talking now because I lost my word. So, Ms. Gleason. So, some of this are things we've already talked about along the way. Each fall we put the program of studies out to the faculty for review and input and then we get changes back. Um, this year we added driver's ed back in over the last couple of years when we had our budget forums. A couple of parents referenced it used to be part of the school day, could it be part of the school day again? Um, and so we put it back into the program of studies to see how many of our kids would select it as a potential option while we try to secure um, potential extra support for it. We used to have two teachers certified in driver's ed, now we have one. So that does uh, complicate it a little bit. And we were able to find someone who could support some of the driving, so we put that into the program of studies. Um, the honors courses are something we've, or honors slash advanced, are something we've talked about before. Those are still in the program of studies, some as separate courses, um, some as the honors are advanced by contract. Um, Mrs. Lenz and I did program planning presentations with every grade level 9 through 11. What we did do differently this year during those presentations is every student got a course selection sheet that had courses, you know, appropriate for their grade level, what was accessible to them as well as all the electives. Um, and we took them through the process of making their preliminary selections so that we would have access to those numbers earlier on. Um, and then at eighth grade parent night, we took those parents and students through um, a lot of the same things, although we did not have the eighth graders do the preliminary course because Mrs. Lenz feels like at that point it's really important to meet with those kids individually to go through everything. Um, all students were given access to the updated program of studies via the website. We do have some hard copies in the counseling center so that if they want access to it, they can get it. Um, and then we took those preliminary course selection numbers and we put them into school tool so that we could start looking at how many kids want this, how many kids want that, and we could start thinking about what that's gonna look like um, for next year. Although it remains in flux a little bit right now because Mrs. Lenz is still meeting individually with every single student to have that program planning conversation, to talk about the career interest, to talk about the college piece, what their future plans might be and how it all encompasses them personally. Um, so again, we have those preliminary numbers so we can look at things and sort of get some ideas. Um, her goal is to be done with the individual program planning by the end of April. 
if the weather gods will cooperate and stop giving us time off. Um, so our goal will be that at the end of April, those numbers will be finalized, and then we can begin the process of sectioning, scheduling, building the master schedule for 1819. I'll add the special ed side. Yes, we had to see. Because another <laughs> factor in all of this is fact is um, what special education is. As Stacy pointed out, special ed drives a good portion of all of the building schedules. So um, currently, the high school special ed teachers have submitted projections um, for programming, special ed programming, so in terms of co-teach, special class, um, direct consultant services, resource rooms, and so on. Um, but we actually finalize those and formalize those during annual review meetings, which will be taking place. So um, those are still a little bit in flux. One major change that we're going to note with our programming next year is that we are going to take the life skills class, which has been a very small group of students. Um, therefore, we've had students that have been attending other classes, such as um, our tech classes, art classes, um, family consumer science classes, and so on. And we're going to have less time out and more time as a group, which allows for a couple of really exciting things. Um, one, it allows for more community-based learning opportunities. Okay, so we, our current class goes into Air's Animal Shelter, Pack Snack Bag. They're really looking to um, do more of those activities outside of our school. And it is also with the class being a full day versus partial day with students coming and going, it allows us to um, bring back two <coughs> more students to our district that are currently in out of district placement. So that's very exciting um, for the class because it's going to be a little bit bigger and Gary left so I can say that we're really working on making sure that there is a, um, a little kitchenette within there because the life skills class does a fantastic job of um, providing snacks for faculty meetings as part of, in, part of their curriculum, teaching the skills and cooking. So we'll have, be able to include that within um, the life skills classroom. So we'll have a larger group so we're excited about that. And it'll help with scheduling because yep. our facts program is popular mm -hmm. and um, the electives that Mrs. Conley offers within that, the food and nutrition classes especially among some of our younger students. And so it's made it challenging to get the life skills students access to that room as much as they used to have. And so for them to have access in their own classroom will, will create a better opportunity for them. Okay, why don't we have uh, questions after each school so that we don't get too far ahead of ourselves. That's Any questions or comments? So on the special ed, one question on the last thing you mentioned, um, bringing back two out of district students, are there extra special ed costs that are coming with those students? Um, and then on the general high school, which honors uh, in your plan are contract and which are separate sections? Um. In the program of studies, the way it is right now, it's the same as it was listed last year. So moving into 10th grade, English 10A is a separate course from English 10R. Um, the same all the way through with the English, obviously. Um, currently in the program of studies, it still lists the English nine and the global nine as being by contract, the advance by contract, and listed that way for the bio honors as well. Um, the geometry honors is separate, which is something we started last year. If you remember, we used to have geometry and then applied geometry, and we moved in a little bit of a different direction after some work that Mrs. Smith did, um, and she had a separate honors geometry section this year and then the rest of our students access the Regents Geometry course. Um, so it's it's in line with what we have currently in the program of studies. So you're keeping the same number of contract sections, or contract honors courses, and the same number of separate sections? Yes, it did not change in the program of studies this year. And the faculty agrees with that? We didn't, I know that there was a survey done. I read Mark's information that he shared out. I didn't get anything that said we were changing it specifically, so I did not amend the program of studies to change it. What have we done with music 
in the high school. And right now, there's a limit on how many music classes a person can take. We provided an audition form because those musical groups in the program of studies are listed as audition based. And we put the students in the courses that we get confirmation in terms of the audition. So last year, um, students would audition for jazz, company of song, and handbell. Um, but there was some confusion about how that information needed to be communicated to students. And so there were instances where students would say, I want this one, but not this one. And so in order to make it clear, everyone has an audition form that goes through the music department. Once the audition is completed and the teacher signs off on it, then it comes back to us. So we currently have students who take all the musics, but they have to rotate through. You can't be assigned, you can't earn the same half credit for two musics that are offered at the same time. So you can be in choir for a day, and you can be in orchestra for a day. You earn a quarter credit if you're rotating between those dates. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I understand the credit piece you're talking about. Mm -hmm. I was emphatically told that you can't be more reasons. Well, for some people, I mean, it, it really does depend on a, a large number of choices, but we absolutely have students who have auditioned and the music teachers, the music faculty have said this person's in this, this, and this, and that's what they're in. And I think the limitation was you couldn't be in handbell and something else. Those well, part of the conversation that we had last year with the music faculty mm -hmm. was that they were trying to, through their audition process, to give students more opportunity and include potentially more students in the various groups. But we've always had students who do every single one. At least since I've been here, I can't speak to before that. But yeah, I'm not going to have that conversation in public. But that's not true. Can I make a comment? Just simply because when you went from that six-day rotation to a four-day rotation, it limited what music courses you could take. Because you used to be able to take what I was told. Right. Well, you still can take all the musics. You just take, if you're, for example, if you're in choir and orchestra, you're in choir for one of the four-letter days. You're in orchestra for one of the four-letter days. But it's not the same amount of time that they used to have, and it's more difficult to do what they used to do on less time. Well, I yeah, I can't speak to that because it's never been a six-day rotation when I was here. Yeah. Um, last year, so, we did meet with the music department. They mm -hmm. made some suggestions to the schedule, and that we followed their suggestions. So, okay, because they always say that we can only go back to the six-day rotation. We have, we, they gave some suggestions last okay. year. We have followed their suggestions in terms of schedule. And then the last question was, has this driven any discussion on uh, looking at the day schedule, blocks, etc.? Oh, you mean the period, period versus block? The, the whole thing of how many we have and all that stuff, has that been discussed as part of this? Well, I'd say that we are we have explored some creative options, like with our ninth grade English and Global being back to back with the same group of students. So sometimes, um, so within the eight period day, sometimes they may have two periods of English back to back on one day and then the next day do their two periods of Global. In order to build in some flexibility, we've done some things creatively that put classes back to back like that, or in the case of our global studies classes, put those classes at the same time so they can access each other. Um, but at this point, no, we didn't change anything in terms of the period structure or the rotation or any of those things. Have we looked at? I mean, we've talked about a number of options and various thing? things. I mean, well, it's brought, it's brought up here in terms of various possibilities and again the flexibility of scheduling if you have a period day how do you try and build some things that create opportunities for time again like they did with the English 9 and Global 9 
it's not been on a large faculty scale at this point. We've been responding to teachers who want to and try or try to do something different. So perhaps a study of the period schedule, which would be a longer term project versus other options, would be something the high school or a small group at the high school would want to engage in. Well, we've heard, we've heard from the student side that we really need to relook at this. And we've heard that concern raised in other places, so I'm asking whether we've done that as a part of this assessment. Not this year. And that is a large, that is a large scale project. Because that is a large scale project. I understand. Yeah, and that certainly could be a project to do. Anyone else? Yeah, I had a, a couple questions. Um, maybe I missed it, but is, is there a scheduling committee? And maybe that's what you were maybe referring to or meeting up to, but or is this, you know, was there a scheduling committee involving teachers or staff? Or we, I mean, we had, again, we didn't change anything. We put the program of studies out to the faculty. And so um, one of the things that will look a little bit different, although it's not completely different, is we got permission to do from um, FMCC to do the intro to stacks as a college and the high school class. It's running as a semester class this year, and so one of the things Mrs. Countryman talked about was doing college and the high school as a semester class, so that students might do the college and the high school algebra opposite the intro to stats, which gives our students just another opportunity to take additional math and um, earn some potential college credits. So people give, you know, again, that was completely driven by Patty. She's teaching the class this year, and wanted to make it a college and the high school opportunity for kids, which because she's already approved faculty at FMCC, it was pretty easy for yeah. her to do. Um, we've investigated similar things for psychology and uh, potentially college and the high school participation in government. Those things are still in progress, and so if we're able to do those things, we'll have to update the kids as we, as we go. All right, is there um, <coughs> going to be any flexibility for any changes, maybe when the school year starts? Kids want to drop or move, or if there's new sections that need to be added, or even electives. Sometimes when the school year starts and everything kind of settles or shakes out, you realize you can offer more, or you might have a teacher that says, I can get 10 or 15 kids who want to take this elective rather than a study hall. Is there flexibility I in the mean, schedule we have, to have We to have that? worked on those things and done those things, and I think earlier in the year, Dina shared the incredible number of changes that happened through school tool for a variety of reasons. Students that wanted to make a change came in and was, you know, this is my thing now, I'm gonna do architecture so I really need to get into DDP or I really need to get into CAD or I really need to get into, and we made those changes for kids and I don't remember the exact number to be fair, but it was large. Um, and she provided me with that number so that I could share it out because I knew that was a question previously. Excellent. The only thing I would just, like, going back to is just, you know, maybe suggest, it's just me possibly having a, a scheduling committee where you put it out to the staff and see who's interested. In it would be a more formal time. process. The process, my understanding, has been more conversations with either individual faculty members or department chairs. Yeah. So yeah. it would really just it might just formalize up the process a little bit. Sure. So it's been more informal up to this point. Yeah, yeah. and scheduling is very difficult. It's not yeah. an easy thing. Yeah. So I, I but that's get it. That's I have a couple things. Um, just my suggestion, if there is going to be a, a scheduling committee, I would suggest definitely get a couple students on that because I know personally if I was on something like that, I would have a lot of input. And also my other question was, um, I know like a lot of kids in our school are friends with like the life skills kids, so I was curious, is there just going to be any time for them to still be able to hang out? Because I don't know, I, I like seeing all those guys. It's really nice. And I know a lot of people feel the same way. I was just curious. Absolutely, we're trying to build in sections so that can take place. Cool. Absolutely. Okay. I just have a couple questions. Um, one is, um, I've raised this question in the past and we've talked about exploring it. But, um, in terms of the number of day schedule, you know, three, four, five, two, whatever, six, mm -hmm. um, 
I don't have any sense that, you know, like four is a magic number or six is a magic number or two is a magic number. But one of the things I think would be useful to do would be to really explore that question and see is it, I mean, as, as Ms. Prime said, is, is it true that a six-day schedule would give us more flexibility? I, I don't know. I mean, I'm not saying that it is or it isn't. But, or maybe a five-day schedule would be the best. Or maybe we should go back to two days. I, 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 I mean, I yeah. don't know. But I think that we should try to explore that in some way so that we can come up with the optimal um, number that would give us the best flexibility and give the students the most mm -hmm. opportunities. And maybe we're there. But you know, there's, there's mm -hmm. issues that come up, and I would really like to be confident that we're there. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can be unless we really take a look at it. And I think the truth is, any time with any variable, whether it's the rotation, the number of periods, the length of a period, there's so many various factors. So it's it's what makes that ideal match of all of those things: length of period, rotation of days. Um, one of the things we had talked about before is there are some schools who really <coughs> rotate through their periods. And we've had a few conversations about this because we have some students who struggle in the morning. We have some students who struggle in the afternoon. And there are schools who do a rotation, so you don't always have the same class at the beginning of the day. You don't always have the same class at the end of the day. So there are so many variations that we could look at and think about what is the combination that makes the the best for us. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's all I would like to do is have that, you know, do yeah. that exploration okay. and have that discussion so that we could, concur. we could arrive at, you know, what would be the optimal. And yeah. We may be there already, I don't know, but I, I would like to feel confident about that. Mm -hmm. We've looked at it for a few years and two confounding factors right now. The high school's seen the drop that everybody else has in terms of enrollment and we, and we are adding more courses. Those two things in and of themselves confound the schedule and make it more complicated because we're adding more one ofs so we have students have greater options within a smaller uh, student body so the high school staff has already looked at rotation of classes kind of like what colleges do a little bit so that everybody in the course of time would be able to take a class if you wanted to so certainly though those other two pieces might warrant another relook and I don't think it's about being static I actually think that the future of education is going to be much more dynamic. It's just probably a review across the district that should happen on somewhat of a regular basis. Well, again, I'm just saying that I, I would like to feel confident that we've got the best you know, the best mm -hmm. form mm -hmm. for what we want to do. Well, and then we and start what, thinking the, the, about things like distance learning, right? And if that's something we want to be able to participate in, when we talk about having double accelerated kids who are not a year, but two years in a math, for example, you know, having an underclassman who's taking pre-calculus. You know, you math us out. And so one of the ways a lot of smaller schools address that is through having a distance learning program. But that takes a lot of coordination with the schools in your area who do that so that you can line up periods and things like that. So there's there are so many different pieces that we could look at to think about how, again, what for us makes that the ideal so. But I think we should just have, I think we should have that discussion. Mm -hmm. and I, and I think if we're, if we're talking about it from a student's perspective of offering options you know, and enabling students to pursue passions that we might not have the capability of putting 10 kids together in class. Those kinds of things give us those opportunities and yes, it creates more pressure on the schedule, but if we're going to go that direction, then we need to build an infrastructure that allows us to do it. Uh, yeah, I was just saying, um, thinking, uh, with this, I know I've said it in the past, and I know it's not exactly the most important thing when it's going to be coming to scheduling, but still, again, with clubs, honestly, if I didn't have my break in the day, because I take a lot of AP courses, like a lot, a lot of AP courses, I would, I don't know how I would be as human being if I didn't have clubs to have like a break in my day and personally like I know with the computer science internship program we need that extra time to come together as a group and if people aren't being allowed to because they are like attending BOCES because you know they are pursuing something there but they also want to pursue CSI uh, it's really hard to not be able to come together because you know some people are off doing this and I don't know and I know there's probably no 
like solution that's completely perfect for that, but I think it's something that has to be taken into consideration. And I know, like I said, it's not the most important thing. Classes are going to be more important than that, but it, it still is. Uh, middle school uh, schedules slightly different from the high school. Uh, we don't really have a course of studies because middle schoolers essentially take a, a rotation of electives that are New York State required. So each grade they look a little bit different. Um, students who have some choice in their schedule are outgoing fifth graders are able to select um, music programming for the following year so they can select between uh, band, chorus, and orchestra. If they don't select any of those things, they still have a music requirement that's met through general music. Uh, seventh graders have a little, incoming seventh graders, or outgoing sixth graders, they have a little more in terms of uh, ownership in the schedule. They get to pick their foreign language that they're going to take for the remainder of middle school and high school. And then as they transition into eighth grade, it really is the same thing. It's, it's just back to music selections. Um, the current schedule that's outlined in the document, we have uh, quarter year rotations, which are every other day for half of the year. And then we also have half year rotations or half credit rotations, which take place every other day for the entire year. Um, when you add all of those bits and pieces together throughout the three years, it's all an attempt to meet the middle level requirements for, uh, for New York State. Much <laughs> um, We actually start annual reviews next week. Um, primarily, we're looking at um, integrated co-teaching classes in ELA and math. We have, in years past, um, offered special classes for ELA and math. We found that the rigor wasn't where it needed to be. Um, our high school special ed teachers um, and our middle school special ed teachers highlighted that you know we're not seeing we can push our students further. So they um, have encouraged us to go to a um, co-teaching model, even for the students that have previously been in a special class, um, because once they get to the high school, they will be pursuing local and, and regents diplomas. Um, so they need to have access to the classrooms. So we were um, offering those um, in resource rooms. We do, we do a variety of targeted resource rooms. Um, in some cases, very um, targeted reading instruction, um, math focus, writing focus. <coughs> That's what we're doing. teaching model it seems we're moving more and more that direction um, is there any evidence behind <clears throat> behind that that says that's the right thing to do and what does that do with our resource needs there is evidence behind that um, it is strongly site some absolutely um, showing that by exposing students to the the whole curriculum, maybe in, perhaps for some students in a more modified, so only pulling out what we call the power standards, the most important key concept, has been um, beneficial. We've really challenged students, especially at the high school level, within the co-teach settings um, and with the general ed settings, saying, you know, we want you to access this curriculum, but we might modify it for you in terms of material you're covering, and they have been successful. So I've had students that are now going to be walking with local regents diplomas because they're having that access. Plus, when you're looking at a co-teaching model versus like a special class model, one of the big things is in order to obtain a local diploma um, or a CDOPS credential, you need to show that you have had access to the general ed curriculum. So that means that they have to be in class with a general ed teacher. So how do we provide that and still provide them support? That's where um, the integrated co-teaching benefits them. Now we do have some classes where there's more of a model of direct consultant. So what the difference there, we've talked about it before, but it's all very confusing. Um, that is where the special ed teacher will come in and just solely focus on those students with special needs. So that has its benefit as well. We've had, we've used different models based on the needs of the students. Um, and looking at the middle school for next year, looking at that group of students, um, we believe that the co-teaching model would be um, would be the most beneficial for that group. In fact, I'm going to put Claudia on the, on the <laughs> stand here because when I walked in, I go or earlier. Um, so I go, we need to, uh, we really need to push our students in terms of math. We've had the special class. 
Um, we're not seeing us getting the bang for our buck when our students are transitioning to the high school. It's not working. She goes, why didn't you do that last year? <laughs> and I go, well, where were you, Claudia? <laughs> so I really think that that group of students, but we take a look at every group of students before we make that decision. I know it's just don't say magically, co-teach for you. It's a, what does the student need? What is What um, do they need in order to succeed? Where are they long-term going to be trying to achieve? So we're looking at students, and you have, you know, we look at factors like um, IQ, achievement scores, life ambitions, and we say, you want to go to community college one day, you're going to have to walk across the stage, you're going to have to earn a diploma, and this is how we're going to get you there. So we really take a variety of, of components, and, and that really plays, and we've had a lot of great conversations at the elementary school, and I've been pretty hard on this student needs to be sitting in a gen ed class. They need to earn social studies credits, English credits, math credits, science credits. They need to know how to survive in this classroom. And so by sheltering in a small group for their entire day is not beneficial to them. We need to teach them the skills in order to succeed so they can be successful. So that's why we, we look at a variety of, of things for our students. And there are some cases where we push and we say, yeah, that didn't work, so let's backtrack. But um, for the most part, we're, everything is long term. How we give them a diploma. So, what does this plan cost? For co teaching? For resources. Yeah, does that increase the resources needed? Is it done on the same number of resources? Same number. Okay. Yeah. Just have one thing, though. Chris, I know you've kind of inherited the situation and just reporting it especially in light of the one-to-one -one initiative. If, if, if that or just in experiencing it for a year, if you have any insights as to a, a better schedule of any kind, we certainly would like to hear it. Um, not necessarily a better schedule, but one of, the, I think, the most shocking things coming in is when I look at my schedule board, I think I have 29 faculty members on, them, on it, and there's only 13 of them who are actually in my building all day. So that's part of the, the handcuff in building the schedule in the smaller district is I'm really, it's driven by the shared staff, the, sh the staff that shared with districts and other buildings. You know, I know that I only have my family consumer science teacher first, second, third period. I don't have a choice when I can deliver those electives. So I know sixth grade students, having math in the morning is beneficial to them, but not all of them can because I have to deliver electives in the morning. I think that's been one of the most eye-opening things coming from a district where I had, you know, 65 teachers alone in my building, where you can creatively schedule a little bit more. It, it real, there really is some handcuffs kind of built in just because of the size of Canada area. Um, but in terms of meeting uh, New York State middle level requirements, we're there. Um, the only, you know, if, if the, the tech integration slash library. Um, uh, position is established that would provide a, a continuation of library studies. Um, currently we do have some students, we have a lot of music options and we don't have a lot of other options for electives in the middle school. That would provide another elective option because right now we have some students who have where they need a half of music credit in middle school might be coming out with two and a half music credits because they're into music but they're also getting put in general music sections because there's not another elective to give them. So that would be an exciting thing to where now we can also continue that library and information technology study all the way through middle school to high school. With shared staff, is that why like when my daughter came home, she takes three, four instruments, but she had to choose. She couldn't do chorus, band, and orchestra. She had to pick her top two, and she won't be allowed to do the third one. That's not a shared staff problem. That's a middle school students have to have a certain number of credits. Our current delivery model, students who I, I believe in the past, and I can only speak to what I've found through research, um, students in the past who have taken all three options, what chorus, band, and orchestra, were not getting a New York State required course. So in doing that, and that was at the discretion of somebody who sat in my seat before me. Um, so if I were to do that, I'd essentially, if, if we were to give them another elective of choice, we'd be taking away something that we're telling that they have to have as part of New York State middle level requirement. So 
so a general music course would be more than an orchestra or a band? No, those, those okay. students who are taking the two of them, so if, if I have a student who's taking chorus and band, they're not also in music because there's not enough room in their schedule. You could have a student who's taken band all the way along that also in eighth grade takes a section of music because there's an opening in their schedule for another elective and that's the elective we have to offer even though they've already met their requirement in band. We have a plethora of band or music classes to meet a requirement that middle level is only half a unit. And we have people, if you take, if you have a student that takes all three, they're leaving with two and a quarter units with no music, and in eighth grade it's part of the music, part of the elective rotation, so now they have two and a half credits. So we have, it, that credit market is saturated when, when there's others that we don't really have anything to offer. It just makes me sad that they have to pick between something that they absolutely love and, and are ho hoping to possibly do in the future. There's a potential solution for that. Perhaps. 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 Because you have to have the requirements. You have to. So we have worked very hard in the past, well before Christmas time, to make sure that students at the middle level are meeting the middle level requirements with appropriately certified teachers. That's been an ongoing process for a number of years. The last piece really is the library eight piece, which we know, and then thinking about how the schedule works. So it's more a function of trying to make sure we're doing the job we should be doing, um, and then trying to figure out all the rest. And if, if my number crunching is correct, currently <laughs> library is the only elective area where we're not currently meeting New York State credit, um, or New York State requirement. Um, the New York State requirement for library is a half credit between 7th and 8th grade. So even though we are delivering at 6th grade, that's actually considered part of the elementary sequence. Um, in 7th grade, 8th grade, they need half a unit. Currently, they're getting a quarter by bringing in um, the library and slash IT or information technology person. Um, that would allow us to fulfill that credit in seventh, eighth grade. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I just had one more comment about um, the quarter year electives. Uh, personally, when I was in middle school, and I know things have changed and requirements have changed for classes. Uh, I know art and technology classes were half year courses, and personally, from talking to Mrs. Eggleston, because I take two of her classes currently. Um, it really has been difficult for her to teach, you know, like all the things that you normally would do in middle school art. And I know personally from taking middle school art, it, it's a lot of fun. And I know from taking middle school tech as well, I don't know how I would get some of those projects done in that short of an amount of time. Uh, and I know that's probably based off of like a lot of different things that I don't know about because, you know, I'm not like an official or anything. But uh, I just, personally think art and tech were like great breaks in my day and really fun electives to take and really fun to take for a half year. Okay. Long. Oh, I just wanted to piggyback off the co-teaching and your question about the co-teaching model and we have continuous discussions and you asked about the um, increase or cost. Um, We've had the discussion that um, we may need to, um, because we have new teachers that have not been through the co-teach training, so they're not completely yeah. understanding the model. Um, you know, so that that might have to come into some type of professional development for them. Because I currently work with two, but I've had three that have not been through this the co-teach model. Um, and then the other pieces is um, with the life skills. Well, you know, we haven't had our annual reviews yet, so if we're having a life skills, a true life skills class, will that change um, the numbers or needs of, of, of the current special ed teaching um, at the middle and high school? So. Okay, um, so well, two things. <coughs> First, um, to all the women here, I'd like to say happy International Women's Day. <laughs> I wished everyone here before you got here, so I'm just, 
Um, the other thing I'd like to say is the elementary um, presentation definitely wins the graphic artist award. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Such good advice. So, at this point, really, we're looking for the, I'm looking at the components that can't be changed, and I build the schedule around that. Special education, without a doubt, drives the schedule at elementary, as does the shared staff. So that's music, art, and library. And lunch and recess, how many aids are budgeted and what that supervision looks like, because right now we're committed to having one aid per classroom when the children go out for lunch and recess, which is something we have changed and evolved uh, in the last few years. Things that I'm uh, particularly committed to are team meetings. That's my first grade team right there. Um, this year, at least three out of five days, grade levels have common planning time, which I think is essential. And they are very gracious and allow me to come most weeks to one of those, um, unless they're doing a data meeting or something. And they just let me know beforehand. And also yoga, to everything that Kevin Settle has done for his grant. And that ties in both to mindfulness, starting the day off right. Um, we can tie it into conscious discipline. This week we're doing the circles program with PPS is partnering with Kevin. And it also gives, um, uh, on a practical logistical level, it also gives my teachers that extra 40 minutes of plan a week um, when we had to do a little fiddling with the amount of special times. So it's critical on that end of the balance. Well, by your graphics. <laughs> <laughs> I gave a snippet about the specialists. Oh, um, um, our co teaching is based on our students, current student population. Um, there's always move ins and move outs, and sometimes the same families doing that. But um, at grades two, three, and four next year, um, those are productive we have had and are used for um, the elementary school. Um, we'll have um, a special class ELA and reading. It's a very targeted program. Um, students who qualify resource rooms um, at grades three, four, and five, and we do um, we continue to have related services in the areas of speech and language, occupation therapy, and those um, vary through dependent on need um, through all the buildings. It's just that we're our primary group of students that receive those um, services are at the elementary. graduation rate. So this is a summary of information that has been shared um, and released by State Ed. So what we're going to do is just kind of round robin a couple of different highlights for you and then certainly you can ask any questions. What, you, what was loaded up for you was this PowerPoint as well as the New York State report card for the school district graduation, gradu easy for me to say, rate data. So high school completers, just to put this in context, is the four year accountability rate as required by the state education, or by uh, federal law the state education department. So here are the highlights and then we're going to pass it around for a couple of other folks to talk about some other things. In 2017, our overall all students graduation rate is 87%. The year before it was 79. So that's for the four year accountability data. If you really want to drill down, there's four, five, and six year graduation rates, but really tonight we're just focused on the four year accountability data. Of those students who graduated, 92% of all students received a Regents Diploma <coughs> and 6% of all students received a local diploma. So that's some good news that when we're talking about an 87% graduation rate, of that 87%, 92% of those students received a Regents Diploma of some kind, either Regents or Regents with Advanced Designation. The other piece about this that is important, and then we'll lead into some of the other conversations, um, is about the accountability groups. So we basically have two accountability groups within our district. All students, well, three, white students, and economically disadvantaged students. So all of our students met the graduation target of 80% because that's, um, that's the state total. Economically disadvantaged students, however, that cohort did not meet that target. Of the students who are identified as economically disadvantaged, that graduation rate was 
So that's something we want to pay attention to. That's something that has been um, an area where we have not met accountability requirements, but we do have some things that absolutely are making an impact and making a difference. So we're going to start by talking about, Becky's going to present on what the strategies are at the high school level. Then Chris is going to talk about some things we're doing K-8 with some help from Stacy, and Stacy's really going to talk about some of the ways we're closing the learning gap because it's a long-term project. This isn't just a high school issue. This is a K pre-K-12 issue, and we've got a lot of things going on. So we're going to start by talking about high school. Then, then yeah, could you sorry. define how you, or tell us how economically disadvantaged is defined? Participation in free and reduced lunch. Now that we're a CEP, or Community Eligibility Program school, that information gets pulled from some of the data census roles, uh, county data census roles for people receiving temporary or long-term public assistance. So we set a target last year to improve the graduation rate through our Canjo great targets and our work with results first. Um, and our initial target was 3%, which we um, obviously, a huge part of what we did was identify <clears throat> early in the year students that we had that were at risk, whether they were behind in credits to begin with, um, they had very various, various social emotional needs that we had to address. Um, but we identified those seniors who were at risk, we had our categories, right? The kids that we knew were on target and were going to be fine, the kids who we were a little bit worried about, and students who were really trying to make up some ground. Um, and so through that early identification and creating some individualized plans for those students, whether it was some credit recovery pieces or tutoring, um, very specific preparation for exams that they still needed to complete, um, and we tracked it often and had many, many, many meaningful conversations sometimes we with showed those up friends. At his stores. Sometimes we showed up at their house. Sometimes we did go In to their homes full of people. to have yeah. meetings with their families so that they knew what was going on and so that they could support those efforts at home, too, for families that it's sometimes it's intimidating to come here. Their own experience was not positive, and so we really tried to make it uh, a group effort. We need you as part of this with your child, and um, we absolutely celebrated the same way by showing up on doorsteps. So um, we track that throughout the course of the year, and every student who was still in the high school. So we had obviously had students who had dropped out previously, but every student who was still attending school made it to graduation. And that work continues this year, again, with the identification of where those students are and the regular tracking of senior course data. The other piece is um, the decreasing course failures, always looking to um, increase student success through that mode as well. And we know we go back now and we talk to our freshmen as they come in and as they're working through. Being a credit or two behind to start with puts you at risk for graduation. So the efforts we do now with the incoming students in terms of getting them to look at the big picture, obviously, whereas with our current seniors, it's a little more feet to the fire kind of thing. Um, but those conversations are happening with our freshmen now, that if you are behind more than a credit, you're putting your on-time graduation at risk. And how can we help you and facilitate better choices and better preparedness and all those kinds of things. So that back fills, back maps, I <laughs> really have trouble with word material tonight, um, into what we do really in K-8 and at the middle school. So everything is connected. So I'm going to ask Chris and Stacy just kind of share some of the things that is happening at K-8. Uh, at the middle school level, um, we have a couple different tiers of uh, things to address our Kandra grid targets. Um, Right now in, in building, we do something called the Cougar Study Den. Essentially, this is um, to try to keep students um, on par with the work that they're supposed to have completed. So on a daily basis, um, there's a list that's 
constantly be updated, changed, additions, subtractions are being made. Um, of students who owe work in any particular class, that list is shared with the grade level team. And those students, we have an hour long lunch recess advisory block. So during their recess and advisory time, those students are actually directed to a content level teacher for work that they owe. And um, they are given a, a essentially a guided study time to um, make up the work that they uh, currently are not completing. Um, in addition to that, we're also starting to do some uh, teacher-student coaching and goal setting. Uh, those students who are failing two or more classes, um, we tried to partner them up with teachers who we felt had a good relationship with those students and do some short-term and long-term goal setting, um, really um, geared towards you know, where, you know, taking a step back and looking at where they are right now in any particular class that they're struggling in. Where do they want to be? What are they doing now that's not successful? What steps do they have to take to be successful? in that class, and then checking in and reassessing and readjusting those goals, just like we do as part of you know, the results first team or the Kanjo grade team. Um, in addition to that, I think we're, we're definitely expanding the so social emotional um, skills in, in the districts. Um, and, and I think, you know, as someone coming from a, a rewards-based system at my previous school where, you know, you jump through this hoop, hoop you can kind of get a cookie. Um, you're not maybe paying attention to what kind of cookie? <laughs> Depends on the group. Um, you know, you don't necessarily you're not necessarily taking into consideration the same needs of students as well as the needs of uh, of staff and uh, faculty members and families. Um, so so seeing that starting to really blossom in the middle school is exciting, and then with the transition to you know becoming a, a little more focused in the conscious discipline on um, practice is exciting. Um, as, as we approach summer, currently um, between myself and the grade level teams, we're also meeting with students who are failing um, subjects that are either going to be on trajectory for um, the summer uh, transition program, where if they fail one to two classes, there's a three to four week program in the summer where they come right here to the middle school and they work on, not only on content, but also success skills, study skills, good habits, things like that to be successful, uh, successful the next year. Um, and then we're also meeting with the students who are on the path of you're going to have to go to a summer school program if you want to advance to that next grade uh, the next year. Um, Stacy, so I'm, I'm going to pass to Stacy. Okay. She's really going to focus on literacy. The last thing that I'm going to, um, one of the conversations of this ward and I are having is how do we, you know, bridge that gap between fifth and sixth grade as it relates to literacy and bringing our sixth grade team um, on board with the programs that they're currently running in the middle school to continue that literacy instruction on the middle school. I'm actually going to take just one step back to talk about summer, um, only because I'm excited that uh, we actually started our Summer Stars program, which is funded through the title of in 2013. So we've done a lot of good work there to boost the literacy. Yes, um, I know, actually, um, that's when I did my Ministry of Literature for 2005. We used to have a summer program, and it went away, and we were able to bring that back. So we're excited to do that. Um, and now, last year was the first year we had in all three buildings. Um, and it again will be for uh, four weeks, four days a week in July this year. So that's exciting. And the literacy is something also that um, the teachers and I have really worked very hard on. And actually, that started talking about internships. It was Jen Travo's administrative internship that did the groundwork, grassroots for the um, the Fountas and Pinnell running record data, where now we can tell you at any time <coughs> what child, and it's by a letter system. You start in A in kindergarten, and you go all the way down. Uh, what level that child is and what tier of intervention they need. Um, also, for the first time in most people's institutional memory that, that I've asked, we have a consistent literacy program, K-5, that a team of teachers selected last year. Um, so there's the K-5. Um, also with iReady, iReady is the program we selected, uh, the teachers selected as part of um, APPR, but it, it also tells us both for ELA and math where the child is and where they're targeted growth, which was very nice, uh, was that when we did our January uh, test just to see how everybody was doing, we had two children, many children, who made significant gains and already surpassed their end of the year goal. So people were proud of that and very proud of all the work that's done in the classrooms. Closing the learning gap for the last slide, um, the, what we've done for our, our little people is um, pretty neat. The fact that we have the, the full day three-year-old program that we were collaborating with Poma, they're the experts in early childhood fact that we've expanded pre-K both with the second classroom as well as the full day. Um, and when I got here seven years ago, there wasn't, there, there wasn't a head start. So the fact that we worked with them and co-located them in our building. Um, Kelly O'Neill spearheaded our home visits from an article 
that uh, we had read, and she's the one who now will go either with a PPS member um, or uh, with a teacher who's available to uh, visit every kindergarten family that welcomes a home visit. We don't require it, but we welcome it. And we also started something, we targeted grade five this year because we wanted them to be successful and prepare them for middle school, uh, where we, the district, funded the teachers coming in in August, meeting with the PPS and Lee and Jen, to talk about the children really target their supports. And then they, um, the, again, the teachers uh, were, had stipends to meet with the parents and the child in the school. So we didn't go to the home in fifth grade, but we had them come. Did you go to some? Yeah, we had them. Excellent. <laughs> I didn't go. We got the van. <laughs> Jen got the van. Um, we, we do uh, the feeding program, uh, the lunch the lunch, breakfast, lunch, just how many kids eat breakfast uh, is amazing. Uh, the parent room, uh, where we now have, I think it's six racks of clothes where kids go shopping, uh, or the teachers bring them in, or parents say during a meeting they need something, they come in. Um, we want to make that even more accessible. Uh, I think in the last slide we didn't talk about the amount of counseling. It's 4.25 or 4.75 4 counselors that we have for services for the, for the children. Um, and the fact that we're going to have one-to-one -one computers, I was talking with kindergarten and they were ecstatic about what we'll be able to do once we have that. Any questions? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, one of the things that, um, first of all, thank you, especially for the graduation rate. I mean, that's, <laughs> no, I mean, that's a real accomplishment, and I think we should be proud of it. But, um, Things, of course, but that's not what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> um, one of the things that I was concerned with is it seems like our dropout rate is higher than the state average. And um, one of the things I, I think might be helpful, which I don't know, maybe we've done this already, but would be to talk to some of these kids and find out what is it that caused them to be dropouts. Because maybe we can learn some things from that that can help us to prevent them. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it's one of the things I've always talked about all along is you know, trying to help them identify their passions and develop them and maybe that could be the book, you know, but I don't know, maybe that's have nothing to do with it. Um, it would be interesting, I think, to, to have some of these discussions you know, with, um, you know, with some of these kids and, and really... It's interesting because the students I've talked to will sometimes tell you more than you think. You know what I mean? It seems like such a personal thing. Um, but a lot of them will give you a lot of information about why they made the choice that they did or how it came to be for them, I guess I should say. And we can't, we, I don't, you know, when we go through and we try to do the cohort and find out where all the kids started from and, and all of those things, some students leave the district if they don't register someplace else, we don't get information, we don't necessarily know what happened on that end, but we have been able to have a lot of conversations with students here who unfortunately have not. Completed. I don't think we make it easy to drop them. I, um, like we do have those conversations. We do try to pull them in and come up with uh, like different options. Like we've, we've done a lot of work, you know, okay, this isn't working for you, how can we make it work for you? One of the first things that I would love it if you could do though, would be to share some of those conversations with us mm -hmm. because I think that would be really instructive and, and helpful in trying to help you to, mm -hmm. you know, approach this issue. And especially that, I mean, I guess there'll always be some dropouts, but I just was upset that we're below the state average. I mean, above the state average. And I'd like us to be below the state average. And if there's anything that we as a board can do, resource-wise or any, any other way to help address it, I think that would be very interesting. Perhaps a future report just on the stories, the yeah. stories. Because, I mean, one of the things they talk about is not only um, is this dropout bad, but it, it increases later employment rates mm -hmm. and, and all kinds of problems in life, so, which is, not, I guess, obvious, but um, you know, I, I, it would be really great to hear some of those stories. At least I, am, am I, are we all going to? Okay. Um, <laughs> so I, any other questions, comments? Um, I'd like to know what you're specifically doing to build the social skills that you referred to in middle school. Well, in, as part of advisory, um, tomorrow, for example, we have a 25-week celebration. So students, we try to take every five weeks at the end of a quarter, at the end of a five-week mark, um, we try to take time to just celebrate being together and you know, encourage students to socially interact with something that's in the school setting but not necessarily academic. 
So tomorrow, we, um, the seventh grade team actually put together, they're doing, uh, we took two periods during the day, and we're doing a minute to win a challenge. So students are put into 12 different teams. They were, they were basically lumped together with, with different students um, in, in different grade levels. And they're going to meet as a team and compete and practice in these things. And certain teams are, the teams are all going to come together and face other teams. Then in the gym at the end of the second period, they're going to have a big, you know, minute to win a challenge between all the winners and also a group of uh, teachers who signed up to play. Just to really build that, you know, kind of social camaraderie together. Um, you know, the more positive interactions that we can get throughout the school day, especially with students who maybe don't interact on a daily basis, those things are fantastic. Um, I think the things that Michelle Mayer, um, and in my building especially, Doris Lever is doing um, just in her library classes in terms of talking about the brain states and, and you know, being aware of your brain state when you're interacting with other people. Um, today, for example, you know, we had a student um, in, in crisis, um, to put it one way, and I think that you know, there's an appreciation out there for how to handle that now that maybe at least I didn't have a couple of years ago in terms of, you know what, sometimes they, you know, they own their feelings and they, you know, it needs to be acknowledged that it's okay for them to feel that way, but there also has to be a plan of how they can, you know, show, vent their frustration and, 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 and I don't want to say act out, but, you know, relieve, release that frustration in a structured environment. And, you know, to see a student have something that, you know, I think could have led to crisis in a different environment lead to a three-minute visit to a safe space, a vent to me, a vent on the phone to a parent for 30 seconds, and then going right into their next class and not having a problem for the rest of the day. I think that's, you know, that speaks volumes to what we're trying to, you know, teach kids. Yeah, really in that self-regulation type of uh, atmosphere. Thank you. Absolutely. And similarly with the high school, um, do you have specific things that you're doing to decrease the course failures? Well, yes, we, especially with our incoming students, we've started a, um, a student support group where a classroom teacher and a counselor meets with small groups of students who seem to be struggling with decision making in terms of whether it be academic, getting their work done, or their interactions with peers. Um, and so they, they rotate meetings with those students to provide them some support within the group, but also strategies to go forth and be more successful. Um, we also have our academic success labs that we've set up, where we have our teacher <coughs> who um, communicates with the teachers quite often in terms of what the students owe, what they need to do, how they could be more successful in the classroom. Um, and then she meets with small groups of students and gives them very personal one-on-one -on -one, um, attention in terms of the work that they owe or strategies, again, that they could use to uh, study skills, how to get assignments completed, even just providing a, a very uh, quiet and structured atmosphere in which they can get um, some of that work done. Um, we did meet and she did some goal setting with those students as well, and that's a process we're sort of refining. Um, in terms of it doesn't necessarily have to look the same for each of the students. Um, and so those are both things that are new for us this year in terms of what we're trying. Although we, we have done some goal setting, especially in various classes. Um, but this academic success lab really focusing on how we can get those students who are struggling to see some success in what they're doing and then build on that success um, by owning it a little bit more and again giving them a, a a space where they can get that work done and feel supported by a, a specific adult in the building. Is that coming from the library resource? Where, where is that? No, we have a separate uh, TA who interacts with those students in the lab. She, we, she's in a classroom typically, um, sometimes different during the day depending, um, but if the students need access to computers and things like that, we do make that happen as well because a lot of the kids, especially with the English, as Tammy mentioned, are doing their projects and their, their reports on Google Docs, and so she's been a great help with that too, making sure they have access if they can't get in, you know, trying to remove those barriers that the students might use as excuses and providing them some resources during the day. And 
that's, that position is uh, funded through Title I monies, which is an appropriate use of that money, which is to provide additional support to students who need it. Okay, well, if you have a long agenda, and I thought you would want to have a discussion about this now, but I would at some point in the future like to discuss about the economic and disadvantage of okay. students and what you can do to increase their success, um, but not now. In addition to all the things we already mentioned, yeah. <coughs> so maybe when we talk next week, we can figure out where to Okay, so moving right along, building the grounds committee. Second is that <clears throat> there are three companies that submitted proposals. Um, I don't want to go into the details of, of them. They're all written here. Um, I don't need to read them. Um, <clears throat> and basically, um, based on discussions with Gary and, uh, and him going through these three different proposals, it seemed like far and away that uh, the Johnson Controls was the most um, you know, attractive partner both because of the effort they put into putting together their proposal and because the scope of their proposal was much greater than the other two um, people that we interviewed. So um, what the Building and Grounds Committee is proposing or suggesting to the board is that we, um, we agree to use Johnson Controls as our EPC contractor. And um, so I would ask if any questions about that or comments. Could we be reminded of how the funding works? I know that it's supposed to wash out or they pass back. Um, is this an annual thing, a monthly thing? How, how does this, how does the actual dollars go, right? Do we lay something out and then it happens over time or? Energy performance contracts require an 18 year payback, of a minimum of 18 year payback period. So when Johnson Controls put together their proposal which included things like heat, uh, lighting and building envelope which is making sure everything's sealed up around the buildings, some of those things. They do a cost projection of savings as well as a cost projection for the project and um, in the materials that I think we posted but this, this was their proposal. <laughs> um, there is a chart that shows the cost and and the payback period. So how is the that what simple PB is? Simple PB's payback chart. Oh, is payback chart. Yes. Is it payback. Simple payback PB? chart. Yes. Um, because I'm not gonna be able to find it. It's okay. I'm, I'm looking at it. It was okay, posted. Okay, you got it. Yeah. yeah, it was posted. So, um, one of the one of the pieces that was helpful when we interviewed the three companies and one of the pieces that I think Johnson Controls brought to us was the most comprehensive opportunity for an energy performance contract with their scope of work and the scope of savings. So that was something that we certainly are really interested in looking at um, in terms of what we can do. Gary, what would you like to add? Well, to kind of follow up on the funding, yeah, that's recently really it has to it has to pay for itself within an 18-year period. They guarantee that. 
Uh, and that's the total cost of the project without consideration of state aid. So, so in this case, it's a $2.4 million project that pays for itself uh, through a, we would get a municipal lease. And each year we would pay that. It's an annual payment to return the money. And then it doesn't include state aid. So at 2.4 million, we would, whatever our state aid rate is, it's around 85%. We would get 85% of that money back to use for other things. So that, just to make it clear, that would be over and above what the, con the, con the contractor would be responsible for. So in other words, this would be extra money that we would have to spend on additional projects. How is it extra money if they're giving us 85% back of what we spent? Because the... the no, no the, the savings, the energy savings is, is supposed to pay for the project. So each year, the money we save, they guarantee that the money we save in energy costs will pay the payment for the cost of the project. So if we just... If I just do simple arithmetic, it's 2.4 million divided by 20 years, so let's just keep it easy. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. So you're, you're talking about 100,000 a year, okay. roughly. So what you're saying is it costs us 100,000 a year. I think you said we do a lease. I think that's what you said. We just put a lease on it, yeah. a bond. We lay out the $100,000 through the bond. Mm -hmm. We get savings back on our utilities right. and that allows us to pay the hundred thousand dollar bond bond off correct but we get state aid on that okay so the savings are supposed to cover the hundred thousand correct correct so that's how the 85 percent becomes extra money. Yes. Right. okay and this reconciliation of they owe us does that happen annually or at the end of the 20 years no, it's looked at in. Okay. And, uh, and, it's, and if the way they explained it to us, because we kind of cornered them on that, <coughs> you know, if, if year one there's a surplus of money, that you know, we, we save more than what they predicted, that's, that's good for us. We get that money. We get it. Okay. If in year two there's a shortfall, they have to write us a check and make up. And it, it continues that way through, but we don't. There's no credit. So they there. never, they never ever crawl back on what we already got. That's what no. they claim. Correct. And we'll have that all in. Correct. Yeah. That's right. part of the contract. Have we had your contract go to attorneys? We, we, yeah, it, that's, no? we don't even have it yet. So no, the preliminary no, discussions for the board to make a determination. Okay. This would be the company. I called two school districts. I called three. I missed one of the calls today from the third one. Uh, but I called some of the school districts with people that I know for references, and um, the things that Johnson Control says they do, they have done. So they have followed through on their commitment. The energy savings are real. Um, one of the districts, one of the options that we have as a district is to gather through voter approval an additional 10% aid on the project. And that would be something that um, we're going to find out. We, I would like to find out some more information and bring it back in a couple of weeks. That there is a 10% incentive aid on energy performance contracts. It requires that voters in your school district say yes, please go after the extra 10% aid. That's all that it. That's all that it says. It would be kind of money on the table. So then we get 95. Yeah, then you get 95%. Well, it, uh, so it doesn't. It brings us up to our 80. Okay, so it's 75 goes yeah, to 85. 75 yeah, goes so, to 85? Yeah, there is, it doesn't bring us up to the Okay, so I think we need to double check. We need to double check. We're, it's money on the table that you would leave if mm -hmm. you didn't at least follow through. So what we want to do is check with legal, put together all the details, like what is this, what does it mean, what does it mean actually in terms of the budget, and bring it back to the board for that consideration. What's our... Um, is it assumed that our monthly expense to, I, I don't know, are the bonds paid monthly or annually? Usually annually. Are they just paid annually? 
So then we can true everything up on an annual basis. Okay. I was just looking at cash flow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. Any other questions? Patty, can we move on this panel if there's a motion? Well, it's in. It's under the approvals. Oh, it is. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right. <coughs> That's where the other chart is. I had read it, but I, I know I saw it. Took me a minute to find it. Yeah. Okay, so if there's nothing else on that, we'll move ahead to the student representative report. Okay, well, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. Gary. <laughs> <laughs> Gary, you Gary. <laughs> I realized under like my like nice things to talk about, I realized I completely forgot something that's like pretty important. It's the new Mac lab upstairs. It's amazing. And I don't leave that room ever. Um, I wish I could like live in that room, honestly. Yeah, I, it's amazing. I just sit there all day and do Photoshop. Um, it literally loads in like two seconds and it's great. And I just wanted to say thank you for that because everybody's a lot happier. Except especially me. Um, <laughs> so the, my other thing uh, was class rank on February 15th. Class rank came out and everyone was really excited about it. It came out great. Everyone was really happy. Valedictorian is Maddie Elliott, uh, Salutatorian Smith Field, and just a great group of people are in that top ten. And everybody else, no matter where they rank, they should be really proud of themselves because everybody we have a great, very, very hardworking people. Uh, just, I don't know, great people in the grade. No matter where their grades stand, they work very hard, and I'm very proud of everyone. All right, then uh, the not so fun stuff to talk about, but it's stuff that other students and myself felt very important because it's not exactly stuff, like I said, that's fun to talk about, but it's at a time where it needs to be talked about. So the first thing is, uh, my question was that, you know, they're at the moment not issues, but they're, they could become issues if I don't address them. Uh, just is there anything that we can better do, do to prepare the students and staff as well if there was an armed person in the school? That could mean uh, an armed student, an armed person who got into the school, because personally, like, I feel kind of unprepared for that. And it's great that we do lockdown drills and stuff like that, but I don't know what I would do if I was in the hallway and somebody, or in the auditorium or in the lunchroom where there's many, many, many people, and it's just a very scary situation to think about. Not something people really want to think about, but it needs to be thought about. And then the other thing that goes with this kind of is um, on March 14th and also on the anniversary of Columbine, there are many, many, many schools around the country planning on participating in walkouts. Pretty much what would happen during these walkouts, if you haven't heard already, is at 10 a.m. students would walk out of the school for 17 minutes in honor of the 17 lives lost in Parkland, Florida. Uh, I, including many other students, find this to be extremely important and it's not like we would be walking out and you know not thinking about these people who were lost we want to make it an experience so that it's not you know just us standing around we want to figure out a way to make it so that it's some sort of interactive experience you know I'm not sure exactly how to do that. So that's part of the other reason why I'm bringing this to the board. If anybody had any ideas how to make this a really thoughtful thing that could be just to really have an impact on people. Um, so we, what we wanted to know is will there be consequences to participating in these walkouts? And if so, what would they be? So, so Ms. Lisa and I already talked about this. Oh, I'm sorry. First, I would like to say that on your first question about you know, what we do with this, and then we have a point on the agenda coming up about a proposal to have a school walk in the building, which I am going to suggest become more of a discussion about school safety in general. And so I'd rather deal with that on, on that point okay. on the agenda. On the second point, go ahead. Um, Ms. 
Lisa and I already had a conversation about actually Dr. Brody, you and I did as well. So we already are prepared that if students want to do that, the best thing to do would be to meet so that we could figure out how best to do it. No, there would not be any consequences. But one of the things we I do need. Agree with that. Based on the legal advice that we're hearing. Can I say something that came out of our um, secondary principals meeting? Yes. I know that the phrase that's being used is walk out, which is, is what they're talking about. But what some of the schools are choosing to do is support the students in supporting students who have had uh, uh, an, a life-changing experience with school violence. So I'll just give you a couple of examples of what some of the other schools talked about the kids wanting to do, and you can you know sort of think about that. Um, one of the schools talked about the kids were going to um, the kids who wanted to participate were going to line the hallway. They talked about potentially reading the names of students who lost their lives or victims who were taken, um, specifically in Florida because it's, it's the most recent experience. Um, some students talked about making it more personal in that they have known people involved in various um, school shootings or, or things of that nature. Um, and they wanted to recognize people they knew that had been involved. And so some schools are, um, as opposed to that notion of walking out, trying to make it more of the students having an opportunity to show their support for fellow students who have had to live through that kind of experience. So again, they talked about, um, and again, different things coming together, whether it be as a whole population or lining the halls, giving us names that they wanted read, um, having a moment of silence, participating it in a various number of ways, but doing it in a way that was um, student driven, but could allow people to participate safely and knowingly so that they understood why they were um, doing it and, and how it could bring them together as a as a school community. That's that's yeah, great because that's what I want it to be. I want it to be something meaningful. I don't want just people like doing it just to like, oh, it's like, you know, 17 minutes. I don't have to be in school. I want it to be like something. And I know like me and Maddie Elliott personally, because she was the creator of that Kanjo Cares Club, mm -hmm. we were talking about maybe because um, there is an address of one of the teachers who like was saving students' lives and was injured in the um, Parkland attack. Um, and we were talking about maybe writing letters to that person or sending cards, making cards. Uh, that was another idea on top of, you know, other things. Yeah, maybe being able to participate in a positive activity yeah. for those 17 minutes, yeah. And those are some of the things we had talked about because there is a safety issue around walking out yes. that we also have to pay attention to. There is some concern just about the, the safety around that. I think any of those really positive things, which is what Ms. Lucin had shared, the things that we were talking about, could be things that we could do. I think it's just a matter of meeting with her and with the people who are interested in figuring it out. Mm -hmm. Again, I think what it is in the press is this idea of right. walking out whatever the various ideas are. And I think what students at least a lot of what was expressed to across the by the various principals at the meeting the other day is students are just looking for a way to say this is happening in the world and we want to be a positive impact on it and giving them the chance to do that right, in a way that hopefully wouldn't cause any other problems right any, any other comments or yeah, there's a number of things that were in the notice that NISPA sent us the legal alert on this very topic. Um, and some salient points that they made. Number one, the speech is supported. So mm -hmm. I'm not saying this from a, yeah. you have the right to say whatever you want. Yeah. And we encourage you to do that, okay? It has to do with what um, support and sponsorship we give. And specifically, um, if there's a large number of students in any given school building who plan to walk out of the school during any or all of the planned activities, 
it certainly constitutes a material and substantial disruption since the educational process will be fundamentally affected. In such cases, school districts would be best advised to review and follow their existing policies, including codes of conduct in this area. The next salient point was <coughs> that school districts who are considering the option of not imposing any sanctions upon students who choose to participate in such planned activities, um, however, would be well advised to consider that other students in the future may be able to successfully argue that they too are entitled to be excused from the enforcement of school district policies, including attendance policies, if they choose to participate in some other act of civil disobedience. In short, school districts must apply their policies in a neutral manner and should not risk being charged with engaging in acts of viewpoint discrimination related to their imposing discipline on students in the future who may wish to support some other cause that might not be regarded as being appropriate by the school district. It would be prudent, this is the safety piece, it would be prudent for districts to consult with local and state law enforcement officials as to the best manner in which they the safety of such students may be protected by the school and law enforcement officials. And the last salient point out of this was in regards to whether we can support it as a district. Some districts may wish to provide support to their students as they engage in the above mentioned activities. However, it would be ill-advised for a school district to provide such support based upon the well-established principle that school districts have no express authority to engage in political activities. This would be particularly the case where, as here, the school district is not in a position to control the agenda based upon it being directed by outside parties. Accordingly, school district sponsorship of such activities would not appear to be a viable option. So I think it needs to be really thought out very carefully. Okay, do you have a comment? As usual, I have a comment. My comment is the following. My own feeling is that I would support whatever it is that the students decided they wanted to do, as long as it is peaceful. I certainly would encourage that you get together with the administration and the principal and discuss what it is that you might do. But I will tell you, and this is going back many years, <laughs> when I was a student in the last century, um, we were involved in the civil rights movement. We were involved in the anti-Vietnam War movement. We were involved in the free speech movement. We were involved in local community school movement. And every one of those movements involved us doing things that were civil disobedience. And I really, frankly, didn't give a darn what they wanted to do to me, because I was going to do it anyhow, because it was the right thing to do. And so I'm just sharing that with you. What you do with that is up to you and your fellow students. I can only tell you that I totally applaud what you're doing. And I think that people who are writing these kinds of opinions, and I'm not at all trying to diminish them, but they are coming to this issue from a very different perspective from the question of what is right and what is proper. And I, 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 I heard everything you said, and I'm, I'm just ignoring it, frankly. And is that, because that's... However, the board, as a unit, has to decide what the school district my, sponsors. I'm giving my opinion. That's, yes. And I made, I made that very clear at the beginning. Yes, ma'am. I just have to give um, my one concern is this is a perfect opportunity to get all those kids outside and some lunatic come along with the gun. That's, just, that's the safety issue. I, I would not want the kids outside at all on that day. The point of this is not that they can't do it or shouldn't do it or that don't encourage them to exercise their free right. The point of this is that they get treated the same way as all of our policies state we would treat anybody that 
that walks out of school. That's the point. And if we don't, are we prepared to um, deal with the future consequences of that action? Because really, that says our policy is nothing. Yes, ma'am. Couldn't the district itself say, for the 17 minutes, we are going to do blah, blah, blah in the class? That way, every class throughout the entire school is partaking, if they would like to, in their classroom, writing a letter or whatever it is you decide. But they're in the class. They're not violating or protesting, but it's like a 17 minutes of silence or 17 minutes of things that you're thankful for, 17 minutes. You know, something they, they could do, but it's kind of a, I don't know, it's just safe, It's in, and it's not violating any policy because then the teacher in the classroom is allowing them that freedom of 17 minutes to partake in maybe whatever the students come up with, five or six different activities in that classroom, or wherever <coughs> they choose in the building, or... Maybe it's in the auditorium. Maybe they do a 17-minute skit on things that they, I don't know. But then it's not violating violating anything, but still having the, the political action of being able to voice their opinion or, or show their support or their, their. It's, it's OK for the students to violate our policy. It's just what we do. We can't be plain favorites. That's what the And I think point Daniel's is. question may have been what are the consequences if they do that. Right. That and our be. thinking in working with other schools and talking with other schools is, is trying to navigate it so that we're trying to find a happy medium. And if there so is a that students can show their support right. without the other issue like regarding this is some people do feel the exact opposite of the way that I do. They're in, I don't want anyone also to be forced to right. do things that they're not comfortable with right. supporting because, right. I mean, I'm, I feel very strongly about this, but other people I know feel like literally the exact opposite. Uh, and that's a whole other issue, but. <laughs> and if there, and I wonder if there isn't, if there isn't, then a happy medium, because we haven't even had the conversation yet to know, then you would advise the students that this is what you're going to do and here's what it means. But we haven't had a conversation yet to even know where, if there even is a way to do this. What would we do if anybody else walked out of school? Do you know that we go try to find that and bring them back? <laughs> True story. True story. Mm -hmm. Call their parents. Call their parents. <laughs> oh, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> we might call their parents. <laughs> don't come to school at all. Then we call their parents. There's an absence policy. Yeah, there's an absence all policy. All those things are what yeah. they're talking about. I, I hear you. Yeah. I've got how many calls at home? Oh, you know, your your child didn't come to school today. That's right. We went to an orthodontist yeah. this morning. So, yeah. But there's a policy. Right? And well, there are other times when students may not show up to school because they may have um, determined that they wanted to do a social activity on their own. Correct. During, we call those parents. Yep. And? And then you follow through on it. Correct. So I encourage you to do whatever <laughs> you want to do. But I think as a board, we have to be careful about what we're condoning and that we don't create two sets of standards. I think we need to have a conversation. And I think there have certainly been other times when students have been passionate about something. You brought up Maddie's Canjo Cares. We've done cards for other organizations. She certainly puts those opportunities out there, and students participate or not. So it wouldn't be unheard of to put an opportunity out there and some students participate or not, because that is what we have done with other community-based activities or you know, the cards they did for the the victim of that fire and different things like that. So the students have at different times participated by choice. By choice. Mm -hmm. There might already be an organization planning something. I have no idea, but I know that the students have have had questions. And 
and that we have voiced the concern with, I just don't feel going outside is the way. And I wouldn't tell anybody if we were going outside as a, as a unit where we were going. Um, I just think there's a better way. And I, the, the input that I've had, it's not just to um, have the silence or the 17 minutes for those people, but to educate on school safety and to be aware of your surroundings and to speak up and to empower students to keep each other safe. Um, so there already could be an organization trying to plan an activity for it for you, which is only three school days away. <laughs> so. Okay, so, um, so I'm assuming you know you will have conversations with Ms. Gruchon and Ms. Um, if there's any reason that the board needs to meet for any reason prior to that, I'm sure that we would be glad to have a I plan to report it to Okay? All right, so is there anything else on, on this? Okay. Thank you, Daniel. And good luck. Okay, the next thing on the agenda is budget. Also posted the debt service schedule and then all the principal's budgets, the music budget, special ed budget, um, and then all the additions that um, the last tab there. Is. Well, everybody can pile. Oh, you're done. Compilation. Everybody. So this last, this last sheet, just for everyone to really take a look, is all the things that have been suggested. They've been costed out. Some um, things, as have been in the past, will be addressed through other means. So we just wanted to give this big document for you to look at and really chew on a little bit. And then we'll come back in a couple of weeks and We'll have a little bit more information about the budget so then we can look at what of these additions may make sense within the context of the budget for next year. Is this one to one different than what was already presented yep. to us? It's the exact same thing. So it's this is still the grant? Yes. It's still the Smart Schools Investment Plan, SSIP. And the IT library position that yep. we talked about earlier, yep. is that in these numbers? Or it is not in those numbers at this time. It is on this sheet and the big sheet. 
It's on the big sheet. I know I, it wouldn't be a year if I didn't have some kind of big sheet, right? Um, and I also have the proposal. What did you say that was around about? $75,831. But that's salary plus benefits for a step one school library. So there's the proposal for you to, again, to read. We did meet with both the school librarians to discuss what the needs were. Part of this initiative, it's also on the same, uh, on the big sheet as well, around the librarians, is we have Mrs. Leverett currently working with our elementary school students um, doing library instruction, and we would very much like to keep the model that we have as Mrs. Jones said, no, and others, no. It's working really, really well. Um, at the K-6 level, you do not need to have a library media specialist. However, Mrs. Leverett does have a reading background. And she's also very good yeah. at picking up library skills very quickly. <laughs> and can read a curriculum and enact it very well. Thank you for that. So we yes. did meet with, that. this is a conversation we've had with, with our other So the librarian technology position would be based in the middle school? Yes. yes. Well, the, the teaching part would be based in the middle school. The tech integration piece would be based throughout the district. So that service provision would be to everyone. I obviously you know this is a lot to digest and yeah. yeah. all at once and, and um, so basically what we're thinking is that we can look through it over the next two weeks and that will have a, a more um, summary type of you know, presentation from the finance committee at our next meeting and then we have a fuller discussion of all of any questions that, that you have and that come up if that's agreeable. One question that yep. in, in regards to the Mrs. Leverett filling this role now, is she meeting the needs of the grade eight no. library instruction? No, no. And she's there full time. Correct? She's K. She works in the elementary school and just does um, grade six. She does a six she and does seven. seven quarter credit so quarter she does credit. this is a gap we've had in our curriculum since 2006 when Falk left there was an attempt at one point to fill it and uh, unfortunately in 2008 as we all know these stock markets and some crazy things and we lost the ability to fill that hole in and it hasn't been completed since then so what I'm what I'm thinking Can I just, just want to Appreciate that, but please raise your hand before you oh, speak. Sorry. Okay, thank you. I, I, I just really want to keep that yes. as a rule. Go ahead. What, I, what I'm confused about is if she's filling this role currently and not meeting the need, what is adding it as a full time headcount going to do to me? Because she's not doing that now. Well, she's at the elementary school and then only does grade six and seven. So she is full time doing that. The idea is that if you add a school librarian that could take grades seven and eight, that gives Mrs. Leverett a little bit more time at the elementary school, and then after after the instruction in grades seven and eight, the rest of that person's day is the tech integration specialist. Okay, so you're splitting Mrs. Leverett's job. Well, the we're, current the current the current job. right right. And she's not covering grade eight. Nobody so right correct. You split her current job and then you add grade eight. Grade to eight it. to it. Okay, now I understand. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay, so we'll discuss this more fully um, after the finance committee has had a chance to read it, digest it, discuss it, and I'll be here for 22nd meeting. Okay, thank you. 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 Th
the next point on the agenda is BOCES annual meeting. So just everyone, please check in with Patty and just confirm with her whether or not you'll be able to go. Okay, and we'll do a party day. Okay, uh, anything else on that? Okay, school safety officer. school safety officer. I'd like to broaden it a little bit to be that in the context of school safety so we have a, 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 a wider range of discussion, if that's agreeable. So I think everyone um, is looking to be of service to schools following the recent national events. Ken Tahiri Village approached me um, and asked for a meeting and they, during that meeting they made an offer to fund a part-time school safety officer in our schools for the remainder of this year. They have funding that is donation money in their budget that would support this opportunity. So um, on Tuesday night, they, the village board did approve the expenditure of funds should the district be in agreement for a school safety officer for the remainder of this year. Yesterday I posted a potential agreement just to show what the functions of and the roles of a school safety officer are. This is not the same thing as an SRO, so an SRO is specialized training, um, it, but a school safety officer is there to support the things that are happening in the school to build relationships with students and by doing so be aware of potentially unsafe situations um, or events. So just so you know, school safety officers aren't the disciplinarian. They don't deal with discipline issues. That's the legal responsibility of school administrators. But they, they, they may do some other things. They may have a presence at large gatherings or other events if the district uh, sees that as a need. And one of the things that um, I've had some conversations with Chief McFadden about, one of the things that makes school safety officers or school resource officers successful in the school is the match between the personnel and the school itself. Um, so I can only speak to my personal experience. I supervised school resource officers in a past life. Um, when it works well, it works really, really well, and that the key was that you had that opportunity for um, the district to help select the right person for the job. And it is about the mentoring and the building relationships, and um, perhaps for some of our students showing law enforcement in a different light. They may not have the same experiences. I mean, I'm married to law enforcement. My future son-in-law is law enforcement, so I have a very different perspective. I know that's not everybody's perspective, but for some folks it may be helpful to have a different kind of relationship. So that's where we are. And that's what they offered. Okay. Comments? Questions? Yeah. Would the potential officer be chosen by That would be a collaborative effort. They would be employed by the police department, but the choice would be by by both parties. Yeah, so you make sure you have the right person. So the okay. it's a mutual agreement. Yes. Okay. That's 
somebody that's existing, an existing officer when he's eligible? Um, they have not uh, shared those details with me at this time. They really just wanted to see first if we were interested in, if the district was interested in having this kind of support for the remainder of the year. I would, I can't answer that question, but I could get find that. I, I definitely have concerns about putting an armed person in school. And I think fundamentally, I'd rather spend more effort on, as the facilities guy was talking, hardening our school and setting processes and disciplines in place like conscious discipline and things that we think are important to build the right environment, then I would be doing this. Well, I share that, that feeling and um, I, there's a number of things I feel. I, I, first of all, there's a bunch of research that school resource officers, safety officers, or whatever you want to call them, do not have a meaningful effect on the safety of the environment in schools. Um, they have not prevented school violent attacks. Um, they have resulted in criminalizing things which would normally be disciplinary issues. Um, and it, it is in general, and it has not made students feel safer according to the research. And I, I read a paper by the National Association of School Psychologists, which which references that I have it here if anyone's interested in looking at it. Where they say that they, they feel this is not the answer. So then the question is, what is the answer? Because I, I frankly, I, I, I just bristle at the idea of an armed and uniformed policeman in our school. Um, especially if I don't feel that it's going to be meaningfully helpful to make the school a safer environment for our kids. So then the question is, well, what, what might, what would really address this issue? Um, one of the things they talk about, and again, that's something that I distributed to, to uh, the administrators as well as the board, was uh, developing a, uh, using a model of, to develop a, a student threat assessment. Um, and what that does is you try to develop a situation where people will communicate these threats, and then you have a, a systematic way of investigating and taking action on them determining whether they are you know, significant, not significant, if they are significant, are they serious or very serious? And, and, and there's even a, a, a flow chart about how to deal with it. Um, that's one thing. One of the things that this requires is that you develop a, um, a team, that's a school safety and crisis team, who will be trained in dealing with situations like this when they occur. And I think that's something that we should seriously consider doing as, as a way to really have some people trained to deal with this stuff. But then the question is, how do we make sure or help to ensure that we find out about these things when they happen, these threats? Um, and that's something that will require education of all of our students. You know, they, they say it for Homeland Security now, to see something, say something. Well, if you hear something, say something. If you see something, say something. And you know, they talk about that students need, that any school security system needs to be student-centered. And so they talk about things that, um, uh, that you should maybe put out a student climate survey. Do you feel safe in your school? If not, why not? If so, you know, I mean, um, and also I think in a way to, uh, to help students feel a little bit less threatened, the actually school is a very safe place for students. The, the, the possibility, I mean, not to take anything away from the horror, horrific 
you know, Parkland, Florida, and other school massacres that have occurred. But in fact, um, there's very few places that are safer for, for young people than being in school. And there's statistics that, you know, are in these articles that, that verify that. However, that doesn't address the, the concern that students have, which is why I think it's important to take action in our school district, you know, to try and deal with this situation. So, once, so they talk about the student climate survey, they talk about an anonymous tip line, so that students either can call or text to a number if they hear a threat or are threatened or, you know, see something or, you know, know that, of something going on. Again, just so that, we be, that we're aware of it, because that's the main thing. You have to, before you can take action, you have to be aware of an issue, something that's going on. Um, train students to report bullying when it occurs, because a lot of times bullying and the victims of bullying are some of the students that, or people, kids that get angry and start thinking about doing crazy stuff. Um, and then, of course, you know, there's one of the things, you know, increase access to mental health services for students where we do identify a problem. And, you know, so, so that we can give them help so they can continue to be, you know, you know, act, you know valuable members of our community. Um, and then, um, and, and just to read to you, I mean, again, the National Association of School Psychologists, their summary statement was, Research regarding schools that utilize armed security generally demonstrate non-significant impacts on reducing violence, while at the same time result in students feeling less safe, is, is what they say. I'm, I'm not an expert, I'm just quoting. So in any case, I, my, my own position, which I, I think I've, I've made clear, is that I don't, think, I, I don't think that the village's offer is one that would be helpful for us in this environment. However, what I would suggest that we consider um, is asking the village if that same amount of money that they're willing to donate for an officer could maybe be used for training for this crisis team so that we could really um, be able to respond to, to threats in a meaningful and, and educated and knowledgeable way. Because there is training out there you know, for these types of, of teams and I think that would be exceptionally helpful in, in, in us being able to deal with it. So I'm sorry to go on so long, but I just need to get that off my chest. Yeah. I had another thought of how they could maybe help us, is in this threat assessment model. They, they might have some expertise to help us in the development of such a thing in certain components of that. Um, so in terms of an aspect to the trained in a lot of things that, you know, to help build this model for our district, they could provide possibly some assistance in, in thinking through different um, ways of handling situations. <coughs> Anyone else have any thoughts on this uh, next question? Yeah. Say a little something. Uh, I personally, I have family that had came from Long Island just a couple years back, moved up here. Um, so one of my cousins uh, goes to the school now, and both her and her mother were shocked about, because they came from a very large school, she couldn't, you know, I could probably name everybody in my grade, she could not do that, because their grade is so, like, huge, it's a big school, uh, and they were shocked, like, that the school didn't have like officers and like you know that it was so small and stuff uh, but at the same time their school was did also have trained uh, teachers and both the officers and the teachers at the same time were very helpful down there and I know it's probably a completely different dynamic here with being from such a smaller school um, uh, yeah so <laughs> yeah just wanted to throw that out there the administrators are more than welcome to participate in this discussion if you guys have any thoughts as well, because this is a decision we need to make and um, I think all the input we can get. You know, if you had 
I've had very good experience with officers, school resource officers, but Mrs. Grimshaw just, you know, the now has got to be the right person because they're not there really, I mean, they're there to build relationships. Resource officers I work with are really seen as faculty, not as the same officers, but they never got involved with any of the discipline. The kid went missing. They were the ones who went out looking for him. If uh, there was a problem at some kid's home, they helped out with that situation. So I, I hear what you guys are saying, and I don't think there's any perfect solution, but 